I have it so dialed. Before he sucks you... at this. Yeah, take, take two. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of The Preview, the podcast where Kanama news, culture, and stories are shared over the warmth of coffee. We invite your favorite Kanama influencers, players, and brand owners to this podcast every week. And I'm your host, Adam. And today we're doing something a little bit different, a little bit special. I've invited my friend Kareem to come over and interview me for our anniversary of the start of the podcast. We've been running this podcast for nearly 52 weeks and have amassed a following far beyond anything I ever would have expected. So join us today as we dive into this week's review, The Drip on Me. Today we're brewing one of my favorite roasts that I've had in a long time, an Ethiopian from Analog Coffee. They're a coffee roaster based out of Calgary, and I'm privileged to have such access to great coffee. So join me as we brew this and get ready for this week's episode. Welcome here to this week's episode of The Brew View. As mentioned, I brought my good friend, uh, Kanama legend, truly, <laughs> Shredder of Canada, Kareem, who's been playing just over a year, but has made huge waves in the Kanama community to come and be on The Review. But it's a little bit different this time. I'm not going to be interviewing him because he still has to earn it. Yeah, one day. Give me like five years and when I'm pro and then maybe he'll interview me. Maybe, maybe. I'm Perhaps. Yeah, we, we still gotta get him drinking more coffee. Now, secondly, uh, he's actually going to be the one interviewing me today. We are coming up to the one year anniversary, and by the time that this goes live, it will have been the one year anniversary of the review. It's been an incredible journey running this show and watching the progression and the development of how this show has taken place. And today, uh, Kareem's gonna be poking and prodding at it and really diving into my story a little bit. The show really began as a interview platform for people in the community and now it's come full circle to the community interviewing me yeah i guess i represent the community now <laughs> but um thank you for having me on the show and thank you for asking me to to do this with you it's a it's an absolute honor i appreciate it um and yeah um i'm definitely not a legend at kandama but maybe one day humility uh, is a key <laughs> characteristic of legends so He's on it. Yeah. So how are you doing today? Let's just, let's just keep it chill to start with. How are you doing? How was your day? What are you drinking? What do you, what do you got in your, in your little coffee mug there? First off, tell us, is that, that's the Cafe Kandama branded mug? This is the Cafe Kandama Kandama Latte mug designed and, you know, well, I, I ordered them, but designed by Jake Shire, <laughs> uh, Kandama Mamba, Sweets Kandamas Canada, a pro team member, team member. I don't know what their exact title is, but he kills it on the editing. And he designed this logo originally for Brew Battle, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. But uh, yeah, he designed this. And I think there's like maybe three left up on the site available. I don't really talk about them that much because I'm kind of hoarding them myself. So shameless plug moment right here. Yeah, shameless there's plug. There's three left on the site, guys. Hop on them. Possibly, yeah. They might be gone by the time this goes live. So <laughs> peep it. 
All right, and um, I also have a mug over here. I actually have one back home in Brooks as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm double, double lucky, I guess. I get to experience coffee on the daily inside of this. My sister actually recently just got like one of those really cool espresso machines. You know what it is. I've shown it. Yeah, she has the DeLong, I think. Yeah, something yeah, like that. Of, yeah, they, they got a bunch of them. I don't remember the brand. Either. She makes me lattes, and I always have it in this mug to, to honor my, my good friend here. <laughs> but yeah, uh, today we are drinking an Ethiopian roast. I was showing it in the little prelude of the episode here, but it's from Analog. They're a Calgary-based roaster. I honestly wasn't always a huge fan of them for a long time, and more recently, this roast in particular, I picked up at Co-op, and it's been my go-to roast, so... Yeah, Ever since a lot. you introduced me to Analog Coffee, I actually went downtown in Calgary and tried it out directly from them. I had a couple of their like iced mochas, and I really liked them. Uh, I, I really like, and you know me, I'm not like a huge coffee person. Like I, I love coffee, but I'm not like a coffee aficionado or anything like that. So I haven't been to like lots of crazy coffee shops or anything like that. But Analog, when I went downtown, I really loved it. Uh, I've been going back a few times whenever I'm stopping in Calgary. Um, and yeah, and that's actually what we have at home right now. We have we have the Godfather at home, which you already know that. that yeah, the Godfather is yeah, yeah. it's, it's really really good. It definitely keeps me awake all night. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, but you're doing well. It's a sunny day here. Um, very beautiful out. Very grateful to have some good weather. Um, and. Uh, Looking forward to having this interview with you and as your friend, even getting to know you better personally through this interview. So this is this is actually a wicked opportunity, not only on this end of being able to interview, but as your friend. Um, so, yeah, uh, I just wanted to to start off with some light questions and, you know, um, let's let's just like take it back and get to know Adam McNeil first a little bit. And then we'll talk a little bit about Kandama. We'll talk a little bit about the Canada scene. We'll, we'll dive into some of your interests and we'll we'll try and go from there and we'll just play the field. Oh, let's so have some fun and drink some coffee. Absolutely. Um, so And thank you for making me this coffee. That's lovely. I appreciate it. He keeps me caffeinated always. I do what I can. <laughs> um, so let's start with your classic number one question that just to, you know, keep some continuity on the show. <laughs> Let's start with your number one question. If you could teach anyone their first spike, who would you teach their first spike and why? Yeah, so I've been asking this question ever since January and I've heard so many great answers from like Michael Jordan to Nikola Tesla to whoever, man. But if I were to pick someone to teach Kanama to, I feel like I'd want to teach it to Colin Sander and in all honesty, not because I know Colin Sander that well or anything like that, but to be the pivotal piece that changed Kendama in North America Absolutely. by being the one who gave Colin his first Kendama and taught him how to spike it and then set the trajectory of all of modern Kendama. To have that as like a, yeah, I brought Kendama into North America would be pretty cool. Absolutely. Fair enough. I mean, like, who wouldn't want to be a part of like growing Kendama history? But you're already actually doing that with this podcast. Uh, you you revolutionized. I mean, there there's a couple of podcasts already around. There's um, the the Devil's Advocate um, from Ryan Reese, and there's uh, the Dama Nerds from MJ and Rod, um, and that's been around for all time. But you're you now I think officially like the third Kandama podcast in the community, and you've actually grown a substantial amount in such a small period of time. Like you said, it's only it's just been coming up to a year now. Yeah, May 29th or May 30th, I believe, was the first day of the original review episode. And I remember you actually talking, because we had just uh, started talking a few, a couple months before that. And yeah, not not much before that. It was, we, we, I think, ran into each other because of, like, using the Kanama Canada hashtag. You found me, and you're like, yo, I'm from Brooks, and I was living in Saskatchewan at the time. And we just started hitting it up. There was the whole Live Ken League series, and I was trying to get you, you know, we, I was, I took you under my wing. Now raise you up to who you are today. <laughs> I, I owe not, all not my even. skills to him, guys. <laughs> not, not Truly, even actually. <laughs> not, no, not, not at all. Your drive is insane. But the that was about the time that we met. And it was in the middle of the whole live Ken League and Ken Live series that I had kick, kickstarted the review. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But actually, uh, going back to what you were saying, there's actually a few other Kanama podcasts that have existed before uh, the review, before uh, the Bevel's Advocate as well. 
There was a few. So there was Molly and Haley Bischoff who ran Click Clack Radio, okay. which was a podcast hosted kind of under the Konami USA banner. And they ran that for a little while, and it was uh, kind of like a news-esque, uh, uplifting Kendama podcast. Honestly, I, I need to go back and listen to the episodes, because I kind of like skipped past that in, in my era. And to be fair, back then, nobody was listening to podcasts. So it was a really small medium, and they were kind of early into it. And I really wonder what it would have been like if they kept it going until today. But on top of that, uh, Chad and his brother Shelton did kind of a podcast series called Coffee House. They're still running Coffee House because I actually, when I recent, not re super recently, but recently, one of the few times that I spoke with Chad through DMs, he was actually sending me a, a sneak peek of one of the episodes um, yeah. where he was brewing tea on it and when we were having our little tea feud. And for those of you who don't know about the tea feud, Adam and I, part of our first part of our relationship was uh, I like iced tea and tea. And he loves, loves coffee, so we had a whole viral war about that. But yeah, that did really kickstart a lot of that. At that point. Yeah, that whole war kickstarted a lot of the hype between you and I, and really, I think, solidified a lot of our friendship and relationship, and also kind of really established, I think, both what I was doing and what you were doing in the community. I think you probably saw a large jump up in engagement and followers during that season because that went on for weeks. The amount of shares it went on for months. It, went, it, went, it, went on <laughs> it literally went on for months. It was viral for a good, like, at least month. Yeah. But yeah, so Coffee House, um, Chad and Shelton run that. They had done a season originally that is live that you can go listen to. I don't remember if it's on podcast platforms or not, but it was on YouTube, I think. And they are filming a, a second season, though I don't know what their plans are or when that's happening. I've talked with Chad a little bit about it. And then as well, there's Georgia Kendama Radio. Shout out to Nick Drummer, Nick Dodenhoff, or Dodenhoff. I don't know how to say his last name. Okay. But Nick, who really is the head of the Georgia Kendama community, he has been rocking it. He has a podcast. He's interviewed a lot of people on that as well, from Chad Covington to, I think he had Kendama Goat on there once, and a number of other people. And he's been doing that. Like, huge props to that guy. He puts on for his local community. Like, he he's not in it for the, like, world of Kanama to gain worldly clout in Kanama. He just like puts on for his local space like no other person ever will. And that's the best way to do it, honestly. Like you don't want to be, I mean, everyone has their desire yeah. for some level of clout or whatever and all that good stuff, but mm -hmm. having like that real investment in the topic at hand and what's mm -hmm. going on is going to always be the best benefit, in my personal opinion mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. And then there was also uh, Lotus Kanama's Isaac. He had kickstarted a podcast and I think he only ever did one or two episodes and then he transitioned to doing YouTube videos. So I don't know if you remember when that whole season was uh, where Lotus Kanamas or Isaac in particular was creating all of these documentaries and these interview style uh, YouTube videos, fantastic videos. People should watch them. He breaks down uh, probably the most innovative player in the Kanama community, Adrian Esteban, and how he changed the game of Kanama from being very like Ken and Tama focused to allowing the string to play a primary role in the game. Absolutely. And so he did an interview with him and broke down the, uh, the, the development of string tricks and, and his story in particular, as well as he's done a couple other videos, but he had an episode called, or what, what was his show called? Oh, I, I don't remember what it was called, but uh, he interviewed Jacob Treble on there. And Jacob Treble A is just such a cool cat. Uh, you know, he was the, the founder of Cobra Kanama and that episode was really interesting just hearing some of his perspective on the game. And dude, I still I still love what Jacob Treble's doing, and I hope he comes back to Kendama more seriously. He's been competing, and he still shows up and does so well in comps. Yeah, I actually just saw him compete in one of the recent ones. Yeah, uh, the was? Pro Invitational, I believe it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, yeah, uh, it's it, for those of you who don't know, I am only a year into Kendama, so a lot of these names, even though I've heard of them and I'm aware of them and uh, such and such, I'm not actually super familiar with a lot of these things because I've only been around for a year. So these new podcasts that you're mentioning right now are like really well, well, like good information old. for me. Yeah, like, like well, new to me. Yeah, but like old podcasts that I had no clue even existed. I honestly thought that you were the only other third podcast. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple, and and if you go on, so I use an app for uploading my podcast called Anchor, and every now and then I go on there and I just search on Anchor, and it does like a total search of all the podcasts that are uploaded via Anchor through episodes and podcast titles. And I sometimes just punch in the word Kendama mm -hmm. to see if there's been any other podcasts in the world that have mentioned Kendama. And sure enough, there have been. Uh, Blair uh, Zimbumafu on uh, Instagram, he's been on a podcast and he talks about Kendama, but it was, uh, 
I think it was like more about his music and his drumming and mm-hmm. stuff. And he talked about the anomaly and it was in the show notes. So I went back and listened to that episode because I found it in there. And honestly, like just Google search Kendama and go to like the third or fourth page of stuff and you'll start finding Kendama integrated into like street culture stuff and whatever. You'll find random articles on Kendama in the weirdest of places. And I love deep diving into that stuff. Absolutely. I'm going to take a second to shout out my boy Blair Zimbumafu on Instagram. That's my rival. So you guys go hit him up. He's insane at Dama. Um, and also a very talented musician. Um, so since we're on the topic of the podcast right now, uh, what has your experience been with, uh, like talk to us about what has it been like starting a podcast as a person who's just never been a podcaster before and you've done this out of the interest in your love of Kandama and what it's been like having this podcast over a year and um, what have you, what have you learned up to this point from podcasting about Kandama? Yeah, so the label of being a podcaster isn't even something that I like took on until probably, I don't know, probably like four months into doing it. Because for the first little bit, I didn't even know that what I was doing was quote unquote podcasting. Mm-hmm. That was never the intention. That was kind of a byproduct of just casual work that I had been doing. So to kind of give a little bit of the the like narrative that leads up to the podcast, because I think that kind of helps to establish what exactly you know my my approach has been to it. Um, I I was working as a college recruiter and I was doing all of these traveling events and speaking, and so I was getting really comfortable just speaking in front of people and. I wanted to get more engaged in the Kanama community when COVID hit and it went to a digital landscape. And for like the first time, it felt like I had an opportunity to be a part of the community because I lived in Saskatchewan in this remote village, like seriously, a village, or I think it was a town, a village of Karenport, a town of Karenport. And there was me and a handful of people there that I had taught Kanama to and that had started playing and we were growing, but I had just watched and watched and watched so many people in other parts of the world just have collectives of people around them, Instagram pages dedicated to their local communities. And I never had access to any of that. I would travel to MKO or travel to NAKO and go, go to those events. But that was like my only real experience of meeting other Kanama players and feeling a part of the community. So when COVID hit and we all went into isolation, all of a sudden the digital community of Kanama went up. And it was a new way to engage in Kandama more deeply than just posting tricks. So mm-hmm. I began to ask the question, okay, how do I show up in this space? How do I show up and be something to the community and, and be different? And I had an order coming in from Soul Kandamas for distribution because at this point I had you know worked on a relationship with Chad Covington and, and Soul Kandamas to do distribution for the Soul Mods in Canada. And he was sending me up a box. I'm a big coffee nerd. Always, ha- well, not always, but for quite some time, I've really loved coffee. And they had the soul blend of coffee. And so he- I asked Chad, "Hey, Chad, do you want to do you want to send me a bag of that? I'll buy it. But if you can throw that in the distribution box that you're sending me as well, that would be great because I normally wouldn't ever buy it because it's, it's the shipping's super expensive and mm-hmm. you're paying forty dollars for a bag of coffee. Yeah, and you can easily buy it here. Yeah, for the same and we have great coffee here. Have really good coffee. Some of the best in the world. And so I asked him to send it and I was like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to brew a cup of it on my IG live and I'm going to review it. And that was the first brew view. When that coffee arrived, I went on my IG live. I did a whole brewing process. I'm pretty sure I did it with a Chemex at that point in time. I believe you did. Yeah. I'd have to go back and watch it again, but brewed it and reviewed it. And I called it a brew view. And sure enough, there was like a handful of people that showed up and kind of were engaged in it because it was a Kendama player talking about something not Kendama. And I was just talking about coffee and nerding out on it. And sure enough, there was like maybe four or five people that stuck around throughout the hour. And at this point I had like 1200 followers, maybe not a great engagement rate. They were mostly my friends from college and high school or whatever that I had known. It wasn't like a Kendama page yeah. at that point. It was just me doing Kendama and coffee and life and all these other things. Biking uh, was another piece. And in that episode, people were like, this is so sick. You should do this again. I'm learning so much about coffee. This is so cool. And I was like, okay, sure, I'll do it again next week. And I had been on a monthly subscription of coffee for Monogram, which is another Calgary roaster. And so when that order came in, I was like, okay, I'm going to review this bag of coffee now. And I'm going to brew it and review it. And I did review episode two. And I did it. And then uh, sure enough, at the end of that episode, people were like, oh, you should do that again. But maybe get on a guest and, and talk about Kendama while you guys drink coffee or brew coffee together. And I was like, hmm, that sounds like a neat idea. And sure enough, I was like, hey, Jake Shire, Kanama Mamba, 
uh, do you want to come on to my live and drink some coffee with me and, and chat Dama? And he was running LKL at the time, Live Ken League. And I knew him. We had been chatting a bunch, helping him get LKL going. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And so I got him on and we chatted and it went decent. And people were like, you should do it again and do it again and do it again. And ever since then, it's just been a weekly progression since then. And it has not stopped. Yeah, it has been going hard ever since there's been one week missed in all of 2020 till now. You can hardly call that a week missed. I was traveling. I moved to traveling. Calgary. Exactly. Um, I remember when you first talked to me because we had just met, I had just uh, found your Instagram page and I had seen that you had had this friendly uh, message in your bio that said, hit me up if you have um, questions about running like a jam or like Kandama groups in your community. And that's what I initially hit you up for because I wanted to start. I don't think I ever had that in my bio. You did. You, uh, you, uh, or it was either in your bio or it was in I'm, that. I might have made a post about it. was in that post where you have the picture of you on oh, like, the Regina The paper. magazine. Yes. Yeah, the magazine. Yes. Because oh. that's what I hit you up for. I found, your, I found that post yeah. just randomly scrolling through the hashtag. And um, that post did well too. So yeah, like it look, got a lot of shares. Anytime Kendama makes it in a magazine. Of course, and it's associated to Soul too. Yeah. Um, so uh, I had found that post, and I and I was like, oh, this is a guy near me. And I, from being like a new player in the community, I knew I knew right away that the scene was very small in Canada. So the fact that there was someone in Canada um, around my age, like mm -hmm. I saw that you were in university as well, kind of, or you know, yeah, just previously had been in university. Um, I decided to hit you up right away because I was w wanting to host them here in Calgary. I, I live in Brooks, which is actually two hours away from Calgary, but I, I was closer to here than you were at the point at that point. So I was in interested in hosting something because I wanted to get to meet new players. Because at that point, still, I had never met another player aside from the person who had introduced me to Kendama, and he he was very sparse at playing um, mm -hmm. at that point too. So that's when I had hit you up and I remember you and I getting along and chatting and then you mentioning doing that review and then, or well, starting off with just like the, the coffee thing. And then it, from there, like we've talked about it from the initial stages and um, it's crazy to see how it's blown up since that, that inception, right? That's um, crazy. It is really crazy. Um, I so I feel honored to be in the background of that. Yeah, I, I forget where the original question was, but you know, I just wanting to understand, um, like, how did you come into like making a podcast, which you answered with your engagement around COVID and everything like yeah. that. Yeah, and then like, what has it been like, and what what would you take from this up to this one year point? What do you take from this experience of starting the podcast, um, meeting all these players, engaging with the community? Yeah. Um, how it's grown and um, maybe a little bit of like where it will go in the future, what ideas you have with it. Yeah, totally. So one of the first things I remember was just like realizing that I had tapped into something different or unique. And that's not to say that doing a podcast with Kendama was unique because that was already happening. There was the Dominards that were killing it. And I don't even think I really knew about the Dominards at that point. I was listening to podcasts nonstop and I just liked podcasts at the time, but I didn't even realize that's what I was doing until a couple months into living here in Calgary, where I started uploading. I think it was September when I put the podcast episodes on a podcast platform or put Bruvy episodes on there mm -hmm. and I started taking it a bit more seriously. But one of the first memories that I have was just the hu humility or the humbling moment of realizing that all of these people that I used to look up to, watch their edits and, you know, fanboy over whether or not it was my favorite pros, brand owners, you name it, it to all of a sudden being able to just sit down with a cup of coffee and chat with them like a human and to share our stories together and to realize that these people aren't necessarily like they're great people and they're awesome at what they do but they're not like glorified people that are untouchable or unreachable or unconnectable and that moment for me was really humbling because i had always imagined you know I, man i one of my first condolences uh where did i put it i think it's somewhere in here but i have a an old ken that is signed by a bunch of pros that mm -hmm. my friends went and picked up for me when they went to MKO in 2017 without me. They had gone a year before. They left you behind. Well, I, Dang. it was like a, a spontaneous trip that they did. And mm -hmm. it was like a couple days, I was in college. I wouldn't have gone, yeah, okay. but, but nonetheless, uh, they went and they're like, yo, do you want us to pick up a Kendama and get it signed? I was like, yeah, of course. Cause I loved these people. I looked up to them. It was you know, your Max Norcross. I don't even remember who all signed it, but I had all these signatures on it of these pros that I just like was so stoked on. And then 
now to be where I'm at today. And Max Norcross came onto my podcast and chatted with me and it was a real conversation. We got into some real stuff and, you know, Chad Covington, Haley Bischoff, you name it, all these, Matt Sweets, Jake Weens, literally all these people that I would have never dreamed I would be friends with or even to ever receive a reply from on, on a DM aside from like, yo, thanks bro. Uh, I all of a sudden was on an hour long conversation or two hours long conversation with them and have been in DM since just chatting and becoming friends with them and realizing they're humans. Absolutely. That, that was the moment for me after some of those episodes and just realizing these people are longing for connection just as much as I was at that point. And specifically in the COVID time, especially, yeah, especially it was, so. it was really humanizing for me to see the true humanness of the people in this community. Well, and it's a rarer thing. Um, and con- it's a rarer thing than you would think. Like you have that right premise of thinking like these are pros or these are, th- there's going to be a gap between us in terms of my accessibility to, towards them. Because in most other situations in the world regarding sports or anything that has professional play or any sponsored level of, um, of gap kind of thing, mm-hmm. um, you usually don't get that level of engagement or interaction on a wide scale basis from low to high end. So like coming from my background, for example, uh, I skateboarded for roughly 20 years. Um, and it's not like I'm going to, but first of all, uh, first off, Instagram didn't it exist back then where you could freely DM and talk with pros and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. even if it did, it was still very rare to say that I wanted to talk to Nigel Houston. It's not like I'm just going to hit him up and like talk to him and whatever. That's not going to happen in skateboarding nearly even remotely as close to it as what it would happen in Kendama. So, but I think the thing that I realized is that, okay, so obviously Kendama is smaller mm-hmm. and, and I think I had that same mentality that you might've had towards skateboarding and then realizing that it's not as big of a leap as I think we often think it is to connect to these people and engage with them. And even in something like skateboarding, I think I have like a perspective now, like if I want to become friends and, and if I want to connect with these people, I know how to do that. And, and it's not by, you know, being a fanboy, it's by creating a platform of value for them to engage back with them or to create an opportunity for others to engage in, in a space. So, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a shared opportunity, yeah. not, not only is it yours to, to engage, but other people can benefit from it. You could be friends with Nigel. Here. <laughs> make it happen. Come on, we'll we'll get him on the podcast, and I'll I'll bait him, bait him into to being interviewed by by Kareem. Uh, they'll probably ask him to do a kickflip, and I'll be like, heel flips only. Um, but uh, just in terms of like that ac- accessibility, it's something that I noticed. It, it blew me away because that's not something I would have expected to even be possible in Kendama. But the Kendama seems to have a lot of oper- or a lot of situations where it kind of blows your mind away. Like uh, I remember the, being able to talk to pros, being able to talk to sponsored mm-hmm. people, making friends with several pros, even even DMing the companies themselves. DMing all the of companies. a sudden, like the company gets back to you, and you're like, whoa, 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 wait, you slide in my DMs? Come exactly. on, exactly. Yeah. I get DMs from like every now and then. Like Sweet Skin Namas will be watching my story and like will send me a message in response, and I'm like. You guys are actually engaged in this community, not just like necessarily making a buck. You're you're watching people's stories. You're engaged in the community. You're watching it, and I know the brand owners. And Absolutely. It's like, what the heck? Yeah, it was it was very like uh, shocking for me to experience yeah. that. Like I I was never I, I never really did a lot of Instagramming or anything prior to Kendama. I'm not a very big social media person to begin with. Um, but once I started Kendama or once I started Instagram uh, or Kendama on Instagram. <laughs> Got my words twisted there. Um, it was it was really kind of refreshing for me to have that experience of being able to connect to pros. And now I'm friends with several, like good good close friends with several pros, yeah. several sponsor people. I have a lot of connections in the community within yeah. companies and within the, that higher up, upper echelon, a, along as well as like along the horizontal value of like all of the other peer players that I have. And it's just something really refreshing that yeah. you have that access of human interaction outside of the skill level that someone is being placed into a box from. Yeah. And that's the unique part of the Kanama community, I think. And one of the things that I've realized has been a a byproduct of running the review is 
so to, to preface, you know, the Canonical community is unique in that you don't actually really know the people that are doing the tricks because it's a very trick oriented community. It's yeah. Like you're showing the product, but not the person. Mm -hmm. And so all we ever see are, are these bangers and these dope edits and all this stuff about the pros. And maybe if you take the time to watch through the sweets blogs or Kusa blogs and stuff, you begin to see a bit of the personality of the people behind it, mm -hmm. but it's very product focused. We don't actually see the people and the review took a different approach and said, Hey, let's put the Kens down no world checks, none of that. And let's just get to know the story behind the Ken. Who's yeah, the guy exactly. there? And as a byproduct of what we've been doing on the review is now a lot of the listeners have felt empowered to go and connect with these pros and realize that they actually have a shared value in what anime they watch or in, you know, what sport they play or whatever it is. You know, I've, I've heard these stories from listeners that have been like, Hey, thank you so much for doing that interview with this person. I didn't realize that they, they did that. And I'm, I'm really into that community and I hit them up or ballast song or like whatever it is. It's like these shared communities that now have bridged because the relationship is deeper than just the Ken. We all share Kendama in common. We are all doing tricks, but let's find out the deeper narrative. I don't know if I'm doing tricks. I mostly miss my spikes. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he's, he's super home. He, this guy, he, <laughs> it frustrates me to no end. The classic Adam thing to do while we're at a 403 CKC jam here in Calgary. I'll mention a trick or someone will mention a trick and Adam will turn and like look them in the eye and be like, oh, you mean this? And he'll slap it first try and walk away. <laughs> he literally did it with like a five tap once uh, in the summer. I, it, 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 it is gross. And I think you, you mentioned it was like one of the first few times that you hit that five yeah. tap. You're just I, lo I love, I'm a very competitive person, even if people don't see that on on the review i think people get this weird perception of me that i'm like this really wholesome like warm-hearted friendly guy and i am, I am. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty but I, but i'm also like this competitive turd sometimes where <laughs> where i don't like to be beat and oh i know i know <laughs> every time i play him in a game of ken i beat him in one game of ken and one one game of uh what was that we played at the mall recently when we cooked dinner together at the start of ramadan for me was that follow? Follow or something. Or race oh, to lose. We did a race to lose. Yeah. yeah, I beat him in one game of Ken, November 7th, 2020. I will not forget the You can tell it's day. a big deal for him because he remembers the date. And I was at Devonian Gardens, and then I beat him at one game of follow recently, and that is it. The guy is <laughs> disgustingly owned. It's, it's I, like to, I like to be a shadow player, you know? I love just lacing in my room and flowing. And my, like, play style isn't what people like engage with super hard on IG. Like I'm not trying to hit long bangers or stuff. I'm just like trying to like work on weird little things in my room and in my free time. And I just like playing. I like the flow and I just don't film tricks. Absolutely. And I always get people now. It's always funny. And, I, and I, I tell Kareem about this all the time. People will slide in my DMs. They're like, so are you competing in this event? What, what division are you competing in? And I'm like, Pro open. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to compete in the pro. And I always like perceive, or at least assume, I feel the assumption that they don't think that I'm at that level. It's because you just don't post tricks no, very often and people don't see you play, so they don't really <laughs> know a good reflection of your abilities. Yeah. I unless remember. they tune into your, like you've recently been doing some lives where you've yeah. been doing some tricks more often and stuff like that. Yeah. So people are starting summer, to get a bit more of an idea. The it, summer is when I usually pop off too. Reminds me, well, I mean, yeah, we only get to play four months out of the year in it's Canada. Yeah, Canadian it's issues. winter, eight months of the year, and it's terrible. And you can't play in the cold, your fingers die. Yeah. But it actually reminds me of that comment. One of the one of someone on Instagram commented on my I'm post. not gonna say like who, the but they, they commented the three tap comment. Um, yeah. So, oh, and, so the yeah, story. Here, here's that. the the little snapshot. This is it. Kind of like it caught me off guard, and I laughed. I chuckled, and I was like, "Oh man, I gotta really prove myself now." But someone on a post that I made, and I was like a one two three tap line. It wasn't even that crazy of a line for me. Like it was, it's something like casual, not casual, hard, but. It was a line nonetheless. Yeah, I had a triple tap in it. And one, two, three tap, toss back to, to Lunar. Lunar. Yeah. And, yeah, and we, yeah, we, I was there when you filmed it. I was filming in the background at the same time. Yeah, and and I was taken aback by the comment because I was like, uh, it was like, I didn't know, I think the comment said something like, I didn't know that you could you three, three tap. tap. And I was like, man, I've been three tapping for like <laughs> two like or three six years. years. <laughs> two or three years I've been hitting triple taps to like whatever, but I never post stuff. And so I realized that People have a different expectation of like my level of skill when I play mm -hmm. and it's just super interesting. But like, I don't know, I, I placed 17th at NAKO this past year. I was just about to yeah. bring that up. And the number one in Canada. And number one in Canada. 
Um, so shout out to you for repping Canada and mm. kind of putting us on the map, especially Calgary area. Um, <laughs> so that's that's super like super dope, man. Uh, but big, big shout out to you for that. But, but, but you're kind of like an unsung hero when it comes to your skills. Okay, but but so. In, in reality, though, it actually really matches the persona of what I've done with review because I don't care. It's not about the tricks. I show more of my personality than I show more of my tricks. And, yeah. and I care more that people see me as me and less about my tricks. I, you know, if OK, I'm like semi defined by doing swivel tricks. Uh, but but like you do hold a world record. Yeah, but OK, but but outside of that. Uh, more people probably know who I am than what tricks I can do. And I think that that is so beautiful to me. Yeah. I love the idea that I might show up to a jam, an event, and people feel welcome to come and say hi to me because they actually know me. And instead of being afraid to talk to me because they don't know me at all, because all they've ever seen are tricks. Because right. I'd be afraid to show up to someone that I've never had a real conversation with and be like, hey, hi, how are you? Uh, I love your tricks. Mm -hmm. And like, what do I do after that? But for me, it's like, I have, you know, whatever amount of thousands of people that have tuned into the review at some point that have heard my voice, heard me talk to people, ask me questions, whatever it is. And to have that relationship be an open door for people and to say like, come on in baby, come on in. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to As the you review. like to say, welcome. Welcome um, here. But yeah, absolutely. That's true. And I mean, it, it it does emphasize a bit more also that you play for the fact that you enjoy playing. Like, I mean, it is a sad to say, but like, it is a common thing that with Instagram and social media nowadays and just those just general trends, how yeah. it impacts, uh, how we interact with things. A lot of people are so focused on only filming or the stress of, uh, like as everything appears on Instagram, um, and that all their tricks have to be there. And sometimes they forget that they're playing for the sake of just playing because mm -hmm. they enjoy it. Like everything has to be filmed. Everything has to be mm -hmm. on camera. Everything needs to be documented, which is really good. Like it's a, it's a great strategy for using uh, as a tool to like it really video your journey, growth, your yeah. growth. And, yeah. uh, like that, that's how I, I, I grow my growth is filming a lot of tricks. Cause when I film, it's my most serious when I'm grinding. Um, so it helps me, but that at the same time, a lot of people get lost in that and they forget to play yeah. just for the sake of playing. So it's really good that you do that as well. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to really wrap that, that concept up, it's like for me, the review and my platform and everything that I'm doing, I've, I've tried to keep it as behind the can as possible. Mm -hmm. And for the Kanama to show up in, in unique ways or in different ways. Well, this is just the glue that brings us together. Yeah. Uh, it's the common denominator yeah. that brings people in, but what keeps them is everything else. Yeah, hopefully. all the deeper connections, hopefully, that, yeah. that you want to maintain. And I mean, it's the most important part. Like, for example, for me and you, like my relationship with you, it, it, this is the It'd glue be, that yeah, hold, yeah. holds us, like this is the glue that brought us together, but it's not what yeah, holds us. We could throw the glue away and I think we'd still be we, friends. No, we would, absolutely. We, 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 we've merged. We, we've, we are we've one been, we've symbiosis. Been, <laughs> we've been welded together. <laughs> you gotta like glue the pieces Take of my out. foot. <laughs> uh, you want to trade knees because mine hurt all the Never. time. Mine, <laughs> we both have bad knees. You really do. I think mine are in worse condition for sure. <laughs> Getting old in Kanama sucks. And we're not even that old. We're just complainers. We're both 25. <laughs> it's, it's a bad sign. Like, we need to stretch way more than we already do. No. Um, but so, yeah, thank, thanks for giving us like an insight onto like how the review came about. And uh, on behalf of everyone that has been able to benefit I'd like to be like I, I, I don't really have much of a place to say it but I, my, I myself and I know many many people that I have connections with have benefited from the show and being able to have deeper connections so thank you for being the person who took on that responsibility and thank you for being the person who had the strength to go and try something new and scary and venture out into a world like that and make something really successful and not only on just a numbers level, but something successful on like an impact level to the people that, that mm -hmm. engage in it. So thank you because now I, I have something else that adds to my love of Kandama um, and adds to the connections that I have in the community. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that that's the same for a lot of people. Um, so I hope, I hope that so. the, I hope that the review con continues to grow. And I hope that it continues to be a positive impact and a positive light in the community and something that, creates even deeper connection for us over the years uh, as it continues to pass and however it evolves. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it, how it turns out. And I'm, I'm happy that I get to be a part of it here and now. That's, that's <laughs> Welcome so here, baby. Come on in. So wicked for me.
Um, so let's talk. Uh, okay, so we've talked a little bit about the the Brewview as a podcast for now, and people mm -hmm. get the general idea. I mean, a lot of people have been watching for almost a year now. Um, let's move away from the Brewview for a little bit. We'll, we'll come back to it and ask some questions about it, like what your future plans yeah, are with yeah. it, if you have any that you're willing to disclose or anything like that. Um, let's talk about more you now. Um, so how did you, like, let's let's talk about your origin story with Kendama. How did you get into Kendama? What was your first Kendama? Uh, let's start with those two for now. We need to, uh, we need to like, uh, rewind uh, sound, sound bit in here. It's like... <laughs> 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 so I, I got into Kendama... Well, okay, so I've been thinking about this recently too. I think I actually encountered Kendama even earlier than when I kind of first picked it up and got into it. Uh, I, I grew up in, in a Christian home, Christian family, worked at Christian camps all the time, and I had attended one camp in particular as a kid growing up where uh, the camp director had a, a Kendama and, and he used to do challenges with it and stuff, but like, I don't even remember playing with it or touching it. And at that time, I don't think I was all that interested. I was really into mountain biking and biking at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big piece of what I was doing at the, at the time. And it was not until about two years after that, probably when I first encountered it, which was after my first year of college. So I graduated from high school in 2013. I worked for a year as a sales associate at a future shop. And then I quit my job to go work at a summer camp again. And it was at that summer camp that I decided to go to college after. So it's been two years since I graduated. And then in my second year, I went back to working at that camp. And at that summer is when I got introduced to Kendama for real. And it was a homie named Ronan, uh, who also introduced one of my best friends, Sean, into Kendama. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that probably a little bit. But Ronan had showed up to camp as well. This is his first time working at this camp. He's rolling around and he's like click clack and doing some Moshikame with his Kendama. And he's like, yo, check this thing out. It's so cool. Give it a go. And I'm like, <laughs> that looks easy. Nice toy, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't remember exactly like what I said, but I remember not like trying to, I remember like having the posture of like, don't be impressed. Don't be impressed. Like, it's not that hard. I'm sure it's like simple and like disinterested more than mm -hmm. anything, but he was persistent and gosh, am I grateful for that? Because he was like, no, 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 no. Give it a try. You, I think you'll like it. And I was like, fine. So I give it a try. And, you know, the, the rest is sort of history kind of, but like that week I like picked it up and Ronan kept hyping me up. He's like, dude, you're, you're getting really good really quick. Cause I had learned like to Ken flip in the first day or two. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't like great at getting it to the spike and stuff. Cause I didn't really know any etiquette when it came to Kendama. I have an edit on my old YouTube uh, account of me doing tricks. And I don't think half of them go to spike because I didn't even know that that was an etiquette piece. Because again, I had no Kendama community. I was just me doing my thing. And I was doing like, trip pull up Ken flip the big cup and I'd be like, yo, what's up? This is my trip. <laughs> and I didn't know Finish, no spike. No spike. I didn't know that there was etiquette to any of that stuff. And I was doing flow and I would do whatever. I just like was I genuinely had this moment of exploration with something. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up at that that week at camp and then I gave it back to him and I didn't touch it for months. I didn't have one. You didn't steal it. No, I didn't steal <laughs> it. I didn't know Joel Nelson. <laughs> Watch your Dama's kids. If you go to an event with Joe Nelson, put a lock on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go back and watch that episode. He's not going to see all Amazing your episode. Super amazing episode. Well, one of my favorites for sure. Um, but so <laughs> I, it was, it was when I got back to school. So second year of college, I'm working in the high school dorm. There's a private high school connected to the college that I was at. And my buddy Ronan shoots me a message and he says, Hey, yo, you remember that Kanama toy that you were playing with? Uh, mm -hmm there's a company called Caleb Kendama that's going out of business and they're selling all of, all of their Kendamas at super, super low cost. And I was like, mm, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get one. And I really enjoyed playing it for the week that I was playing with it at camp. And, and I ended up just buying one. I think that night from Caleb Kendama, it was like probably like eight bucks plus $40 of shipping or something. I don't know. Oh, but how do I wish? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, it was a super cheap Kendama. I don't have it anymore. I gave it away to someone and I don't even know, but I'm pretty sure it was like a walnut or some dark, it was a darker wood. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go way back into my IG to find it on there. It was a Caleb Kendama and I picked it up and that's really when the rest became history for me is I just started playing with that very like, first explorer kind of mentality. I watched the Zuma Donkey edit. I saw some other edits like D Westy, TJ Kolsnick, all the like pros of that time that I really loved. 
And I, I just picked it up and kept playing with it. And I had all sorts of fun games that I do with the kids in the dorm where we make like dares and challenges out of it. Like if I, if I land this trick in under three tries, and it's Canada. You have to run a lap around the dorm in your bare feet in the middle of winter. And we'd like do dumb stuff like That's that. That's risky. <laughs> it's super written. <laughs> but like we would do these. Don't trust your children around <laughs> Adam. He's not he's not a good influence. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, we did all these like challenges that were like fun things to do to like challenge ourselves at this toy. And I would do it with some of the dorm kids that we had and, and figured out. Well, it helps fun. make you grow, actually. Like, when there's that pressure but, or something yeah, like that it, as a motivating factor. Yeah, but for me, ever since the beginning, it was about friendship. And it was yeah. all about the community of the game for me. Even when I didn't realize that I had a community. I didn't have, like, pros around me, but I had people that, like, enjoyed doing dumb stuff with it and fun stuff oh, like yeah. that with it. And so that, that's how it began for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, friendship is a huge and important part of Kendama, like I've never been a part of a community until Kendama. That was the first time I was a part of a community, so I understand exactly where that comes from. And to now some of my closest friends, like you and Blair, um, Mateo as well, um, and a few others, um, I can't mention it, I mentioned everyone, but um, all come from Kendama, um, and they're some of the best relationships I've ever had. Um, and yeah, Kendama really does so much more than act as just a tool for playing a game. It is a tool in so many other ways. Yeah, I have a, a locked away, unfinished uh, blog <laughs> post for you talking completely about all of that. So maybe you guys can check that out one day whenever I finish it and get sent over to Adam. So sorry, Adam, it's been like how many months? Uh, a long time. The, blog, the blog's on the back burner at the moment. It'll yeah. come back to life one day. But um, yeah, no. It's, I, I would definitely be playing, like, I love Kendama to a point where I would be playing regardless of the friendships that I had or not, just because I love it so much, how much I enjoy playing it by itself. And I do mostly play by myself because I'm in Brooks 90% of the time. Like, I only can make it out to Calgary so often to play with mm -hmm. other people. So I'm quite isolated and I'm the only player in Brooks. Um, I've passed it off to a few people, but they really haven't taken much to it. Um, but... Friendship is a huge key to helping you actually progress in, in Kendama and as well as just yeah. to continue enjoying and like loving it because I don't think many people would st and this is one of the big talks on your review with Max is yeah. um, Not many people would really stick it out really really hardcore over a lengthy period with Kendama because of you gotta have a whack mindset to be able to do that in my in my personal opinion because he's calling me whack <laughs> <laughs> No, but seriously, like when I look at it's tough. No, I admit it's hard. I, I don't, it's I don't, really tough. I don't know if I would play if not for the Instagram community around me. And I don't know if I'd still be playing if it wasn't for relationships like yours with me and this community here in in Calgary. Like having people around me physically has changed the game for me so much. And the review now has really deepened my love for the game more. So it's than, an extension of that community. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I I think if you are able to play Kanama by yourself in isolation for any number of years, dude, props to you, because that's insane. Uh, to me, Max Angel and his testimony is incredible. like, you have to love the game itself so dang much to be able to pull that off. And like, I love Kendama, I really do, but I love the deeper parts of it. I oh, love absolutely. the community more than I love the game itself. You love it in its totality. Yeah. Um, and that's there's nothing wrong with that, absolutely. Like, that's part of what it is. Um, so that's, that's really quite amazing. Um, and yeah, so now that we understand like what, a little bit of your origin story, <laughs> Mr. Superman over here, um, let's talk about some some of your like your play style. Um, oh, and you didn't mention uh, what was your first mod that you actually can remember that you had? Yeah, I, because we we did talk about that you had some kind of a walnut or something. But what's the first re recollection of a mod that you had? Do you have it here with you that you can show? Yeah, so it's one of two. I actually don't remember what one I bought first. Uh, where is the Ken for this one? Loading. Yeah, I don't know where the Ken is, but uh, it was an easy mod, and you can you can see the Tama here. There's a chunk taken out the the half of it here. The same one over here. Yeah. So actually, Jared just got me that one as like a gift. Uh, because he knew that I loved the EG mod so much. So this was the original Slate Dog 1. Uh, I love the stick player. This unlocked a ton for me. But so this was one of my Thomas and I still keep it and it's like deadly honed. It's got a slot up the side of it. You can see the ash just like beginning to split and it's so grainy. Like here. That's actually pretty. Oh, and it's like chunked. Yeah. Yeah. Right off the and side. Then, and that's such a tiny bevel. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You can't barely fit your pinky in there. 
Yeah, and so one of the other originals that I had was this Konami Yusei mod. It was uh, TJ Cole's name. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the first mods that I also got a pro mod. First, I think this was the first pro mod before I got the EG, I think. I'm not 100% sure. And just compare the size of that thing to like, okay, <laughs> the Lotus is an actually huge Dama. So but, like, well, even like, but like, yeah, size comparison is crazy. Size, it's the cuts are crazy. tiny, and the bevel is really tiny, but um, yeah, th so these were some of my first Kanamas. I still have them again, a little chunk up the side here. <laughs> the paint is non-existent on 99% of this Tama, and the camera really has literally chunks out of it. Yeah, yeah. that thing is... Uh, that thing has seen war. Oh yeah, this is, <laughs> this is heck and home. You need to donate that to uh, uh, Jared Porter's fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm keeping that one. Those, those are the two oldest canoes I have uh, in, in my collection still. Absolutely, but, and that's wicked that you still have them. Yes, yeah. it's, it's really cool to have some memorabilia. I I still have my first and It's like I, I wish I did. I I'm glad that I kept it because it's kind of sentimental for sure. If I did, it would be up on the the shelves behind me for review if I still had it. But Absolutely. I don't even remember who I gave it to. That's the problem. I'm pretty sure I'm like okay. he's such a good guy that he just gave it away. I I like give away so many of my favorite kendamas to like my third cousins uh, kids mm -hmm. and to my nephews, my nieces. I just like yeah, just spreading the love. Yeah. What. I love giving that stuff away, and A, I think part of it for me is like releasing that into the world and releasing that same passion that I had with that that exact yeah, exactly. drama, and yeah. then passing that off to someone to keep well, that like, fire going. You, I remember, uh, you remember when we went on our trip to Grotto Canyon in the summer and we stopped by Tim Hortons? Was it a Tim Hortons or a McDonald's or something? It was a Tim Hortons and I regretted every moment of that. <laughs> and you gave away the Jacob Treble mod that you had from one of the MKOs or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't to, remember what one was. But yeah, it was. I think it was blue, um, if I remember correctly. I have it saved somewhere in my um, story highlights. I'll have to go. I, find I just it. gave away four more Cobra Kanamas because I had a whole stack of them. I gave them. Uh, to yeah, some you got a kids. bunch of those. Yeah, I got rid of like four of them literally two days ago or yesterday uh, to some of my like neighbors that live in the back alley here. Yeah, actually, one. I think the first Dama you ever gifted me was a Cobra Kandama. No, I don't. Uh, yeah, you you gifted me. I, I don't know if it's the first one living here. So. I don't know if it's the first dom. I'm pretty sure it's actually the first dom you ever gave me yeah. as a gift. Uh, but you gave me. You a, already like, own too many canals. I, I do own a lot. I, I went through a buying phase because I wanted to figure out what shape was best, and I couldn't. I couldn't know yeah. until I bought all of them and tried them for myself. So I just bought every single shape, and then I figured out what I liked. Um, which it was it was expensive, but it was worth it. But um, what I was gonna say is. Uh, you gave away the treble mod, um, and then the first uh, Dama that you gave me was a Cobra, and you gave me like a pristine condition, like the best condition Cobra Beach Natty that you had. And I was actually playing with it the other day in my in my room, and I was like, I, I can do a lunar flip on. I don't this. even remember giving. It's not even home. Yeah, you, and it had some like it had a pink and blue silk string on it. You okay. gave it to me as like you, you, I'll send you a picture of it sometime. You, it was yeah. like the first Dama you gifted me, which I really appreciate because now I have a piece of like some history that's kind of gone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I still have a bunch of them. I think yeah, like, I got one. I still got a bunch in here. Some of them I'll keep because they have cool homegrown Thomas on them, mm -hmm. like the homegrown designs. And then whatever you know, there are lots of different unique wood types. Cobra was cool. Is that Thomas? Thomas Jacob Jacob Trouble. Trouble. Wow. Shout out to Jacob Treble. He was onto something, and I I just wish we would have seen more of Cobra. But who knows? Maybe Jacob Treble will make come back, and Cobra will make come back. Yeah, who knows? Put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, was uh, <laughs> wait, wait, this is a live uh, chat. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what it is? I, I, oh, I can't hit my legs because I have a laptop, <laughs> so that's what I went for, but I think I this works pretty good. So it's only like Dodgeball. <laughs> that's from Dodgeball, for yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. what, what was their name? Yeah, Cobra, it's like the uh, Cobras. 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 Yeah. Um, glad so, that we both suffered watching that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, to answer the other part of your question, like playstyle wise, a lot of my playstyle originally derived from TJ Kolsnick and Iji. I loved String Flow, I, and Dave, like Dave Mateo and Kenyatta. All of the edits where it was more of an art than a technical the skill. The Flonamic duo. Yeah, the Flonamic duo edits were literally what I lived and breathed on. I even have a Flonamic duo mock edit that I did with my boy Troy when I was living in Sask. Uh, he was a break dancer and we both loved flow and string and stuff. We did an, uh, a video, it's still on my old YouTube channel, where we had a whole bunch of different damas and we each did a trick with all of them and then we did a doubles trick at the end and we tried filming so many Flonamic duo stuff. You gotta do a Flonamic duo edit with 
Thomas Boyvin and with Ray, and Ray Bo- Full yeah. Trio. Yeah, yeah, the Full Dynamic Trio with them. That would yeah, be really cool because they're both insane slayers too. So yeah, and, and, they, got and they have the OG skills too because yeah. they're OGs. They've been playing like seven, eight years. Yeah. So that would be really wicked to I, see. But but that was the culture of Kendama that I looked up to. I didn't like I I loved and appreciated what Dylan Westmoreland was able to do with the Kendama, but I never attempted any of the things that he was doing because it was so outlandish to me in terms of like the way that he approached it. Because again, I didn't grow up doing spikes. Mm. I like I got into string and flow and whipping it as a hand roll and just keeping it always in fluid motion. It blows my mind. You know and, me, I suck. It took him, how many hours did it take you to teach me how to hook in your backyard? Yeah. Not that well, I don't it think was, it was, it was like two hours probably. But but no, seriously, that was that was my play style. That's what got me into it. And like I said in my first edit, I didn't spike hardly anything because I didn't know that that was a thing. So doing tricks that were techy or like spike focused were very out of my forte. But if you asked me to do flow and triple space walk and like uh, swirls, butterflies, I figured that stuff out. Casually so says trip space walk was like an easy thing. <laughs> well, I just like, I, I don't know. Like, it I mean, shorter strings, but yeah. I don't know like what mindset I had when I came into oh, it's just, it's just what clicks with you. Like yeah. you, you know me, like I, flow doesn't click for me. Uh, anyone who knows me, uh, even on Instagram, they, I have maybe one flow post posted to my grid and that I pushed myself to put out and it was very hard for me. But I flow doesn't make sense for me. String doesn't make sense for me, but tech does. I can break down tech. I can see tech, I can break it down and then I can emulate and like replicate it. Yeah. And so it's just what works for you. It's, it's how your body works. It was just what I was always fascinated with too. I love watching downhill mountain biking or I, any sport that had fluidity to it. I loved watching break dancing. And I remember like as a kid growing up wanting to break dance and I just mm-hmm. like thought it was, you know, like it would be lame if I did it and I would be cool if I did it. So I, I never did it, but I thought it would have been dope. I loved watching, like it sounds so cheesy and lame, but I loved the step up series as a kid. I thought it was so cool. I like wanted to be in that so bad and I just <laughs> love the, the art of motion. I love, Absolutely. I love watching something be a performance where everything is always in tension and in movement. Mm-hmm. When it's stop, start, stop, start, it's like, okay, it's, janky. it's janky to me, yeah. even though it may be technically incredibly difficult. Watching something that is always in motion, I don't know. There's a like, satisfaction like, to it. Like I can admit, like as a, as a tech player myself, I don't like, and that's why my tech is, I make my tech fluid tech as much as I can. I try to have flowy tech, yeah. but um, that's not always the case, obviously, because it's tech. But I recognize, and I what I love the most about fluidity is in flow because it's always moving, it's always yeah. continuous, it's always smooth, it's always it, one thing passes to another without with seamlessness, yeah. which makes it so so much more enjoyable. Um, and that's something that you just don't get as frequent. It's possible in tech, but it's not something that you find as frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's something like. Even if I'm a float, or even if I'm a tech player, it's something that I envy. Like it's, it's a very cool thing. And I've seen you float countless amount of times with your <laughs> eyes closed. This guy literally will look away or close his eyes and do an entire flow line, and he'll still get the spike too. It's not all. Usually, I open my eyes for the spike. At the you, end, no, I've seen you get the spike. I have, eyes but it's hard. It, it's hard, but you still have done it, and it's. it's to me, that's just an argument. So yeah, I always try. Like if, whenever anyone asks me to teach them flow, because for some reason people want. I like one of the the key fundamentals because I teach flow not from like a technical aspect. I don't think you can learn flow by like breaking it down technically. Maybe some people can, but let me tell you what he's going to say. Close your eyes and (laughs) feel it. (laughs) Seriously, close your eyes and just feel the tension. Allow your like sixth sense to pick up where the Tama and the Ken are when they're just rotating and spinning. You, if you take the time to close your eyes and begin to slow down the motion, understand the fluidity, where everything is always intention, you will know where it is. I can do entire flow lines aside from like spacewalks because you, then, then you, you have, have no attention. You're yeah. not touching anything. And like you can do a single spacewalk with without looking, but anything Maybe, double or higher. Yeah. I mean, I can do a single one, so I it's hard. Good. But it's hard. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's like I can do most of the string tricks. I can do eyes closed if they're touching a, a part of my it's body. Some yeah. And it's just because of the tension. I think anybody can learn it, but you have to. I don't know. It's like, you remember uh, Avatar the Last Airbender? I'm a big, big fan of Avatar. You know when Aang is trying to learn how to earthbend? It's like he had to take a totally different mindset uh, oh, to how he did it. 
and his fluid mindset didn't allow him to do earthbending right. the yeah. way that you know he needed to learn how to do it. Same way would go if for an earthbender trying to learn you know airbending. Uh, it, it's two totally different mindsets of how you approach them and how you do them. And you need to be willing to step out of the mindset that you've been in to learn how to do the other mindset. Yeah, I'm still I stuck in my, my, so my bending my, mindset for sure. Because when I like when I try to approach flow, I try to break it down like I break it down like tech. Or what, like I break down tech, which works to some extent of a degree. Like you can apply some physics and mechanics to it, but ultimately you're right. It is something that's a feeling yeah. like at this point, I do have some level of flow down and I can flow yeah. certain lines with my eyes closed. Um, and, yeah. but it is, you're right. It's completely feeling based, but yeah, that's, I guess that's something that people don't really know a huge amount about you. Like, unless they've, they've seen you. Well, recently. I don't, I don't share it. Stuff, right? You don't share it, but like, uh, unfortunately, I, I get to see it quite a lot whenever I'm with you, and that is, it's a really unique thing, but that's your play style, and it's very OG. Like, and you, I would say you're considered OG for how long you've been in the Dama community, or very close to, you're, you're I'm very happy, like, closer, I, yeah, I, I, and you, you brought, you're brought into the new gen of the tricks kind of thing. Well, th that's the piece, and you know, I've talked about this on the review a bunch, in terms of, like, the timeline of Kendama, of when things kind of happened and shifted. There was the OG period and there's the new gen period, but there's kind of this gap in between where it was the transitionary period where a lot of people left Kendama. The that's experimental when, period, per se. Yeah, that's when I came into Kendama, mm -hmm. was in that gap space. And so I came in watching old edits, not current edits. And I came in a little bit after the pro lineup of the Sweets Kendama's guys and started playing in that space. And so I was learning from the old while picking up what was new. And I had crafted this style of my own doing that was a blend of a little bit of everything and kind of turned into this melting pot that is now me. And am I the best at OG style? No. Am I the best at new gen style? No. But can I do more than good enough at even? But can I do both of them and bring them together in a unique way? Yes. That, which is one of the most beautiful things. I think the, one of the coolest what that is style that I aim to have. I love tech. Don't get me wrong. Tech will always be my primary focus, but my goal is to get good enough at flow where I can combine flow and tech. And I think that's the coolest like merging of things. Yeah. Like if you can continuously flow between tech to flow, to flow, to tech, to tech, to flow, yeah. you're, you're taking the best of both worlds. You're taking complexity yeah. and then you're taking fluidity and mashing them together. Yeah. The, the person style that I really look up to right now is Kevin DeSoto. Kevin DeSoto has bridged the flow and tech world really, really beautifully into his play style where he's very good at incorporating these subtly techy lines, but also a master of string tension and flow. He, oh, yeah. he is so calculated with it. He can do all the OG style stuff. His space walks are nuts. Everything like he's very honed. He's very extremely good at honed. Yeah. But and he, but he's not into like the crazy tap tech of what everybody else is doing right now in the modern generation. And I love what he's done because he's taken my two favorite worlds and bridged them together into like a picturesque style that I'd love mm. to master. And so I love his play style. Yeah. Shout out Kevin Soto. Kevin is. Uh an absolute homie and he kills it and his yeah. typhoons are insane yeah. his typhoon tech all of his tech is really yeah. inspirational um so yeah that's it's great that we get to know a little bit more about your play style and uh, you guys know what to expect if you ever do see clips from him or if you ever end up come playing a game of ken with <laughs> but yeah please come to calgary and hang with us and uh I'll we'll school you in and, the game. <laughs> and I'll just watch from the sidelines and cheer for you as the underdog because I just want Adam to lose every once in a while. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. I beat Jared Porter last time. Dang, man. Uh, I'm the king of, king of Calgary. So if I beat you and you beat Jared Porter, does that mean I've beaten Jared Porter? No, and and I only say that jokingly <laughs> because Jared was going for ridiculously <laughs> difficult oh, tricks yeah, in that no, game. I did hit some gnarly sleep. tricks in that game, though. That was a dope game. Mm. I was stoked on the tricks I hit. That was the last jam that we had, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that I was hit, I hit really three, two, one, uh, tap, jug, like three tap, jug, two tap, jug, one tap, jug, spike stun uh, in that game again. I was I was very hyped. It was the first tea, first tea attempt on it as well. Yeah, that I remember. That was a wild day for all of us because that, that was, I at least, uh, I have a, a low key, I'm dropping an edit on Monday. This is going to be out way before, uh, yeah. that will be out before that, but go back and peep it. Um, and there was some tricks in there that I hit first tee at that jam um, during games of Ken. And yeah. just, yeah, that was a really wild day for all of us. Um, so yeah, 
be afraid of his his flow style. It's kind of it's kind of nasty. The guy's got some airbending wuju in him. Okay. <laughs> um, so when do we actually speaking of tricks? Like while we're on that topic, when are I know that you've mentioned that you have like a YouTube on the side that is kind of like hidden away. That's not your main YouTube. That might have some small little yeah. They're not worth taking there. your time to go watch. Unless you, you just they're let's cringy. exploit him. Let's let's watch the cringe. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'll, I'll put I'll maybe put the links to them in the yeah. That would be actually really cool so that people can see that. I I want to see they're it. old. Yeah, I I'd love to see it. It'd be cool to see that. I thought I had shown you that. Anyways, I, yeah, actually, you've shown me some things, but it would be really cool to be able to watch it again. But when are we going to see an actual Cafe Kendama, Adam McNeil, the coffee man himself, Bean Juice Boy, as I like to call him? I hope that sticks with this interview. Um, when are we going to see an edit from you? Like a, a full length edit? Because I, I, you talk about this all the time to me. You're always encouraging me to go and make full length edits. And you're always talking about how much you love edits. And like you and I both fanboy over N Nativ having some of the best edits in the game. Um, so when do we get to see a full length edit from you? Hey coffee gang, Adam here. Just want to say a couple thanks to everyone who made this episode happen. I'm talking about Kareem, all the past guests, and all of you listeners that have joined the journey of the review up until now. And thank you to those who have dedicated a small amount of their income every month to supporting this caffeinated adventure via the Patreon. In this moment, we did have a slight technical error where the memory card ran out and we had to replace it with a new one. And we enter into the second part of the conversation here at a little bit of a misstep and we forget kind of where we left off, but we picked it back up and I hope you enjoyed the rest of today's episode. Uh, what's important to you about like uh, having something that pronounces style and really shows you off? Or is it just about like compiling a bunch of tricks, trying to get something really cool, maybe being innovative, creative, uh, like... What is important to you about edits? Yeah, so the edits that I appreciate personally the most are ones that have a crafted story that aren't just a 10 Instagram clips that you normally would have taken and then put together and mashed them up. I think that's boring and lazy when it comes to like making a, an edit. And, and people do it, right? And it's like, it's a great way to like show off your tricks. Well, I mean, just a lot of people show... also aren't like videographers or editors by yeah. nature. So they don't really know like yeah. the etiquette of making an edit. Well, no, 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 totally. So like that. for me though, like perceptually as like a viewer, mm -hmm. I just find those boring to me because it's like, okay, I'm not, I don't actually really care about the tricks you're doing because I like the tricks are cool. Great. And every now and then I'm like, whoa, that's unique. But I've probably seen most of the tricks you've done in your edit. Someone's done them somewhere, unless you're like a new, 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 like top of the top of the tier player. Mm -hmm. I want to know your narrative. I want to see the way that you put them together in a unique way. Yeah, what makes I, it you? Yeah, what makes this edit Kareem's edit? What? Because I there's I, anime in it. Spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> <laughs> but, so for me, it's like I I actually want more of a visual story that goes alongside with has like clips of review or whatever and it's like a narrative that plays of brewing coffee and mm -hmm. and it's very picturesque in that way it's like me has b-roll of me walking in a cafe picking up a cop whatever it is just coffee coffee, Something coffee. coffee related yeah. yeah but like bridging the humanity of who i am into the edit so people get a picture of me behind the ken and the tricks to play such a back role to oh, what's absolutely happening. and I the mean, tricks are are what carry the momentum of the piece you're correct yeah the, like it, the tricks are the very surface level in terms of the edit because I, yeah. hey, most of these tricks have been done before, probably better, a cleaner, whatever it is, well, yeah, like, more style. It could be any of those things, but the tricks aren't really the focus. Like it, it's more, how did you do your trick? Um, how did you compose it? What like, um, also yeah, even like, that doesn't matter to me. I don't like, no, no, I mean like, how did you compose it? Those are all like, those are all surface things that may add to it, add to it, but it still stays surface level. At the end of the day, it's what can the person take away from the edit that they can relate to? Your music choice, how you how you um, presented yourself, how you told a story, how you found other elements that they can connect to you with. Um, so uh, fundamentally, an edit is meant to be, and like any visual, uh, any visual piece that you're going to consume, it's always something that needs to be focused around a story, right? Yeah. Um, that's the best way to get a, uh, a viewer engaged and really uh, find a way to relate to the situation at hand. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, all, all that to say, the edits I really like are Natibs uh, because, A, yeah, their tricks are amazing, but the way that they've choreographed what they're doing is beautiful. I think the most inspiring videos to me are the Max Norcross Pro edit, the 
in terms of just trick composition and like the vibe, Dylan Westmerlin's Downtown Days with TJ Colesnick, mm-hmm. that was one of the OG videos. The Flonamic Duo, you, there's so much emotion in those. Mm-hmm. There, it's very emotional watching them like get pissed. Oh yeah, and destroying Kevin. And Dave yeah. just like kept going at it and going at it, and you could see the visceral amount of emotional damage that they were under in terms of how long they were grinding for that epic trick. <laughs> emotional and back. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, and the uh, the recent Stay on Your Tablet edit, not even oh, edit, yeah, movie. the Stay on Your Tablet. It's basically a movie like it, that. It is like movie. forty seven minutes. Uh, 30, 30 or thirty seven minutes. Thirty seven minutes, but. I, I could care less about the tricks that were done in it, but the vibe. Oh, the I've watched thing, it like six times. The whole movie is carrying me through a narrative that is so beautiful that at the end of it, I can't not play Kanama. Oh, I usually am, like, while I'm watching it, sometimes I'll watch it at home no, at I night. I put my Kanama I end up. up putting, I end up, like, pausing it for a second, grabbing my Dama, and then playing Dama as I watch it, because yeah. it just gets you that hyped, and you're like, I just need to play Dama right now. Yeah, whatever edit I create, or whatever edit someone helps me create because I am terrible at filming. I'll be your filmer guy. I, I want it to pack emotion. I want people to leave watching it saying, I want to change something about who I am and what I do. Hmm. And I want it to be more than just tricks. I want it to be something that has emotion that is deep. And that's what's held me back for so long because I could, I could take a bunch of my IG clips and put them together and make a YouTube video. And you could just make a banger, like a a hammer video. Like I'm actually, the one that I've put together is just like a hammer video. Yeah. But, and and I respect those. Like I I genuinely appreciate them and what they are and what they stand for. But there's more that can go into it that makes more value. Yeah. For me, I just, I just don't want that for me. I want something different. I want to do something different. I want to be something different. And it carries the same overarching visual narrative that I've created of, I want to show behind the can. Yeah, absolutely. More deeper connection. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so um, just a little more technical difficulties as usual. Uh, I'm not the best with technology, um, but so that's really wicked. Hopefully we do get to see a edit come from you and I'm looking forward to whatever story you do end up telling. And if I can help you film that, you know, I'm your guy. Um, so more about you, since we're talking about this behind the can and everything like this, um, you used to BMX back in the day. What would like, that was your main thing, like BMX and uh, mountain biking specifically, uh, biking in general. Um, that was your hobby prior to Kandama, correct? Yeah, that, and I played World of Warcraft. That, and actually, now that you say that, I remember you saying that you were one of the top players, or at least your team was one of the top players, yeah. uh, contenders at a certain point, which is pretty crazy, because World of Warcraft is like one of the biggest online games there is. Yeah, it, it's Second not as much anymore, weapons. but but back back when I was playing, yeah, we were the number two team in North America for the category in which we competed in. Which, Can I have your autograph, please? No. Uh, and but but I was stoked. I you know back then like I was in high school I was just nerdy. I was I was such a weird kid because I was athletic and nerdy and like I don't know geek story ever, but like I, I I like dabbled in everything. I'm the guy who can pick up everything and do a do enough to pass at it and to be good enough at it. I just like anything I touched. I anything that I touched and I cared about. I wanted to be one of the best at. Yeah. And I have always been that way about everything. And I climb to the top of whatever I can get to as quickly as I can. If it's coffee, I nerd out about coffee until I have it down to like a core science science where I'm like proud of like what I know about it. Kenama, I've gotten to a pretty high place with Kenama as well. World of Warcraft, any video game that I've ever taken seriously, I play it to like the degree in which I I get really high or I don't play it at all. Hmm. And so like, wow, I was, I was, you know, in the top 50 players in North America at in number two at the class that I played, if we were just breaking it down in that. And, and I played very competitively in the, in the day and while I wasn't very big back then, so there wasn't a lot of money and about made, made a little bit of money playing the game. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, but BMX. So on the BMX and, and mountain bike side, that was my physical that piece that I really enjoyed. And I got into it right after I graduated high school. One of my buddies that I worked at the camp that I worked at with, he had a BMX that he brought out to the camp and I like messed around with it and I just like started riding it and we had a mountain biking skill at this camp. So we'd like had dirt jumps and tracks and I would always ride the BMX on the dirt jumps and stuff and like learn how to do stuff that everybody else used a bigger bike for. Mm -hmm. And I used a smaller one because I always liked the challenge of doing doing it and i would i liked the control that a bmx had it, it, definitely a more agile because yeah, it's being more tactile and smaller right yeah 
So I got into it and I like went deep into it. Not like crazy, crazy deep. I was never like insanely good. Deep, deep enough to hurt yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll get there, but like, I, I took it fairly seriously. I, I would go to the skate park all the time. I had put probably $1,400 into my bike. It was a nice, uh, oh man, gosh, I'm going to forget the, the brand of, oh, it was a fit bike. I had the Tommy Duggan bars. I had nice 1664 metal pedals and uh, cranks. It was a dope bike. It was a creamsicle color. It got stolen uh, when I was in Karen Point, so I lost oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I was a little bit bummed about that. It was already after I dislocated my elbow. But yeah, so I, I was riding BMX bike. I like followed everybody. I was really engaged in the culture. I wanted to go out to Crankworks. I was like looking, I wanted to fly to like New Zealand to go ride in New Zealand and stuff. Boys International. I, I wasn't that good though. I just like loved the culture. Of it. Oh, absolutely. You can still, love it and still want to do whatever you yeah. want with it, right? Uh, and then, yeah, actually like biking and Kendama were really competing in my life. Uh, when I was first getting into Kendama because I would Kendama during the winter because I could do that in my dorm and I could do it inside mm -hmm. and I would bike a lot in the summer. I had built all these dirt jumps in the town that I was living in that became kind of like a staple in the town and I'd been riding them and riding them and in the summer I was pretty much BMX, 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 Kendama in the winter mm -hmm. until 2015, I think. And then that's when you dislocated your elbow. Yeah, I think it was 2015 or 2016. Yeah. It was the last weekend of the year going into my final exams. It was like April 16th or something like that. And I was finally trying to huck a 360 over dirt gaps. And I can do flat 360s, no problem. Mm. And I could like do them up of step ups and I could do whatever, like fly out 360s. I was getting fly out 540s. And I went on the dirt jumps. I went out with my buddy Nick, who was filming me and photographer. Uh, uh, photographing me doing tricks because he wanted to get some cool like action shots mm -hmm. and then uh, another buddy who was like a younger kid in the town he was videoing it we went out and I hit the jump and biffed a 360 landed on my elbow and popped it right out Dang. and it was intense like it was it was a bad dislocate like the worst dislocate that that hospital had ever seen they had to take me into the emergency room they had to call my mom I was on fentanyl they, they called my mom for permission from her because I wasn't conscious enough to give them permission to cut me open if they needed to because they had eight different people come into the room to try and wrestle my arm back into place, but it was so badly dislocated that the muscle tension in my elbow had wrapped around and tightened around. So my elbow was like popped out here and it, they couldn't get it back in. So they gave me muscle relaxants, took me into the ER and wrestled me some more apparently and then eventually popped it back in. But I was in a cast for four weeks after that and then I came out of the cast and couldn't move my arm. Oh yeah, for, I, I, I've broken yeah. nearly 30 bones, so I know how it goes. And, and I was told like, I probably can't really ride my bike for probably a year or more. And you know, by the time I finally got some of the flex back in my elbow, I was just playing Kanama and that, yeah. that was all I really It's the do. safer sport to play until you start hucking trip goons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Poor Blair who hit himself in the face today. <laughs> yeah, so. I don't know, like that moment changed a lot for me. Absolutely. I, I put away biking for a long time. I would ride and, you know, just cruise, but I didn't hit jumps. But you still, you still ride casually from time to time now with a bit more grace per se, I would say. Yeah, I, I sometimes still get a little freaky with it, but uh, I like, <laughs> I like downhill but mountain biking riding now more. BMX, it doesn't have shocks to like help absorb some of the impact on my elbows. Yeah. And so even though it's like a smaller jump or whatever, the impact is just harder. Mm -hmm. So I try to go out to Silver Star once a year, which is a hill out in Verdun, a mountain up there. They have a fantastic mountain biking uh, trail or system out there, park lift. And I love riding it. It's so fun. And that is one of my like summer passions. I don't get to do it as much as I wish I could. I, I want to buy a new mountain bike. I don't really have one right now. I have a dirt jumper. Dude, they're stupid expensive. Like Gotta make that 30, 30, uh, 3500 bucks to get like a decent enough bike to start riding. That's ridiculous. You gotta get that Sony A6400 before then. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't uh, like. Yeah, no, I was never big into biking, but I've had several biking in injuries, uh, other injuries. Uh, this is a very similar story. Like I, like I said, I was skateboarded for nearly 20 years and I, that's how I destroyed my leg. Yeah. And ever since I destroyed my leg, I never went back to skateboarding after that. And that's how I actually like got interested in Kendama partially too, because it was lower risk and it was something my body could do, but it was almost having the same thrill and exhilaration and adrenaline that came with some high intensity yeah. kind of thing. 
So that I can relate to that for sure. It's it's really rough having injuries though. Totally. Um, but I'm glad that you're doing good, and it obviously hasn't held you back because you've absolutely slay on the dog. <laughs> I, I do miss riding as much as I used to, and I mean, I think I would have done it more if my bike wasn't stolen yeah. as well. So, like, it's maybe huge. in the future, if I have kids, like, I think it would be something I want them to get, or like, I'd want to do with them if they were open to it. Is do BMX or mountain biking? I'd love to be in a good enough shape to still be able to do that. No, absolutely. Like, of, of yeah. course, yeah. No, you want to always share whatever your passions are with your kids. I think yeah. family gonna share Kandama with mine. If they <laughs> don't gonna force them, if they if are they, they gonna have to know, know they family. need a new family. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about that the other day. <laughs> and they don't play Dama. I guess. Uh, I guess you gotta, gotta be on your own. Like, I'll give you a place until you find a new family. But once you no, find man, a new family, they, you're they, gone. They can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> you're way harsher than me. <laughs> uh, this is a joke shout out to whoever your future wife is you have a really tough guy to handle <laughs> uh, so um, we've talked a little bit about you some of your past uh, interests BMX we've talked about the podcast um, are there any other interests or hobbies that you currently have um, going on in your life or that you're looking for, forwards towards trying out one day eventually? Like, what are your current goals in, in that area? Yeah, I don't know if there's any other hobbies that I'm, like, stoked to give a go mm -hmm. with at the moment. There's – what okay, so one of the things I do want to do is – begin to look at expanding the review to hit a couple different audiences. So what that could possibly look like in the future as a way of bringing new people into the Kanawha community, because right now the review serves as a bottom of funnel type of, of entity in the Kanawha world, where the only people that are coming to the review are people that have A, purchased a Kanawha, B, are dedicated enough in the community to C, find this podcast that shares their values and exactly. then takes them even deeper. Nobody is coming to my podcast and then buying a Kanama and then coming into the community. I want to change that narrative a little bit because I think that that's such a room for growth. And the way to do that in my perspective or what I think can be done there is by maybe once every other month or once a month in the future, if it scales up, is bringing someone from another skill toy uh, niche or from another subculture niche that I think shares similar concepts or values to Kanama and bringing them on the show. What was the name of that episode? Was it Barstool? No, not Barstool. Uh, <laughs> Barstool Sports is a big entity. Oh, okay. I uh, have no idea. Oddball Sports. Oddball Sports. Yeah, Oddball. So, yeah, so, so doing more of that type of uh, engagement and yeah. cross-community like cross community interaction kind of thing. Well, yeah. Which opens up. Because, I mean, like, obviously, like, Kendama has developed and uh, evolved from a, the influence of a lot of other skill toys and existing things that yeah. like juggling came from juggling obviously yeah um and a whole bunch of other things um flow came from like the flow arts like poi and stuff like that so um it's of course you're going to attract those same kind of um people from those other subcultures and sub communities that share similar traits that kendama shares so it's it's a really good way of accessing yeah. a, a, a bigger market and growing kendama that way yeah so yeah, ultimately, like the hope is maybe in the future to start doing that just as a way of bringing people that don't play Kanama into a Kanama conversation and potentially actually attract a different type of Kanama player that first finds the deepness of the community and then picks up the toy. Because yeah. what a unique narrative that would be to have someone who just like fanboys over the culture that we have because of the podcast and then is like, finally, okay, I've heard so much about this culture. I love what you guys are doing. I need to buy one. Absolutely. That would be such a cool story to me because imagine that person's influence in the community. They come in with a whole different set of expectations. They aren't coming in with the ego of I need to hit a trick. I need to do this. They come in with the, the pride of like, I'm a part of this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's totally different to me. And I think it's beautiful. I think it's so dope. Yeah, no, that would, I think that would be so cool. That would so, be super cool. Like that. And that would be a testament to show really like, cause we do always talk or, and, and within the community, it's always talked about as this is like one of those much more rare communities where there's a lot more like love, gratitude, um, support, yeah. um, camaraderie, all of that kind of, uh, yeah, on, on a per capita basis, on, on a per capita basis. We don't have I, I, tool, but yeah, <laughs> which we talked about as well. Us and our statistics and qualitative and quantitative yeah. analysis. But obviously like any community has its struggles. We've seen them Absolutely. as well. You know, we, we have I, I skirt around them a little bit, but I would say we back. do pretty well. But yeah, we, we have our issues in the, in the community, but I think generally speaking, comparatively to other 
communities or subcultures, it's a fairly open and welcoming space for, for all people, yeah. generally speaking. Generally speaking, yeah. There's always going to be things. Yeah, no, there's going to be issues that happen. It's, yeah. it's the same and as... We work on we, we try to work on them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's that's what we can hope for, is reconciliation and resolution. And that will speak more testament to the community, and that's hopefully what will bring more people in, and make also people feel safer to stay yeah. too, kind of thing. Like, not only just bring you in, but keep yeah. you too. Well, so actually hitting on that for, for a quick moment, that's actually one of the key pieces of like the value add that I think review holds in the community and podcasts and other third party media. This is what we were talking about in the last podcast episode I did with the Dominards and the Bethel's Advocate. We talked about third party media and its role in Kanama. And one of the biggest outtakes for me from that conversation and in general kind of going into it was things like the review, things like YouTube channels that aren't about the tricks or about new Kanamas and stuff like that. Our main role in the Kanama community is retention, mm. like keeping people engaged and keeping them deeper. Because if all it is is product and product and product and product, we're going to burn out eventually. Well, and, and product is something that you buy and hold on to, and then that's that's in your pocket. It's not something that you can, like you engage on it in your own ways, but yeah. it's not something that gives you ulterior motive to continue yeah. engaging and finding other ways or going deeper or anything like that. Yeah. So, so anyways, re- retention is like the piece that I, I pride myself over and I'm, I'm like, okay, how can I keep people in this community from leaving? Because I don't want to see another exodus of the Kenoma community. Like what I had walked into when I first started playing, mm-hmm. which was a lot of people kind of left and it died out and simmered out. And now it's on this new rise. And I think that we'll probably see a recorrect at some point where it's something will happen and we'll see a dip but it won't be as significant and then we'll, we'll keep climbing or we'll just stay on a steady growth. Would path. you attest that to issues or like lack of like issues or lack of certain types of other forms of engagement? Or would you say it's just the nature of like the toy? Because like at that time, Kendama was much, a much more simpler toy. Well, it was the um, same toy. We just approached it more simply. It, yeah, it was, it was we seen didn't really and the yeah. complexities of what it So could be. it hadn't evolved to a level of play where it was as enticing to people. Like for me personally, if it was cups alone, I wouldn't be as enticed. Yeah. But because it's evolved at the level of play, it was, like I say this all the time, if I found Kendama yeah. maybe like 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have been as interested. Oh, totally. But yeah. So, but now, even if I found it like two, three years ago, I would have been interested just because I like I like the aerial play. I like that like the experimental, um, different type of uh, styles and all of those different things that makes it attractive to me. Um, so, would you say the tricks are a very big component of that? Do you think people will like? There will be kind of a period of like stagnation where the tricks will kind of stop because we're in an explore, very explorative period right now. I would say. Yeah, I think like so. We're in a third wave. Most people. Yeah, would say. I call. I call. I think I. I don't know if I was the one who really coined that terminology, but definitely like one of the front runners of saying like, "Hey, I think we're in a different generation or different wave of Kanoa right now," and I I've been calling it kind of the the I don't know if I call it the third or the second wave, but in that category because the first well oh, okay first wave would be japan like originally yeah, i would say first second wave is colin sander exactly. and third wave is post colin sander generation french case. and then into a new his french case the the piece that changed kendama i would say i don't know if it was community I've, i would say in terms of the community that's probably one of the most like it's one of the key symbols i think of the change i'm i actually haven't deduced enough to know what the definitive changing piece was that changed Kendama from the like Colin Sander era to the new generation era. And I actually want to say that more likely what that change was is a lot of what Sweets Kanoas did with their mob and getting influencers outside to bring in a new generation of players that don't, that haven't hinged on past design. Mm -hmm. It was actually a new you know, a new like genesis of bringing in players that had no experience of what came before. Mm-hmm. That I think it actually is probably more what it was. And Fringe Case was one of the key pillars of it that said like, hey, let's, let's you know, create a new path forward of how Kanama could be played. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of pieces in there, but competition is one. The, the level of play also changed a lot. So if you look at the OGs and you look at today and the gap period between, there's been a exponential amount of growth between those two places of play style and the people who stuck around are now still the heralds of the community mm-hmm. anyway they're like all the brand heralds <laughs> Herald, yeah, well, <laughs> what ben harold oh fringe case the, ben, the, the ben <laughs> heralds of the <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i so to answer the question that you're talking about of like how Trick do i see 
you know, the future of, of Kendama going. I think that the key pieces that need to be figured out in order to proactively prevent a dip is more third party media. Absolutely. Is more community events and to really solidify the relationships with the people in the community because I think that that's what lacked in the previous generations is that they were very pro oriented, very trick oriented, very like these are the pros and these are the players and there's a gap in between here that is very impassable and I'm trying to play the role of bridging those gaps so that you can see the direct and clear path towards that and also make it a level playing field for people to engage as a common people and a common community. Yeah. Because if we can... And everyone will benefit more so from that. Yeah, everybody's going to benefit more and if we can create more culture, more community platforms for that, more events, more of like a foundation for growth, we will be able to scale much better because I don't, there, there's a common principle in uh, running advertisements or building a business is you want to nail it, then scale it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we might be a little heavy on the scale it side of like, okay, we just need to sell product, more economics, product, get product. more product out there, push more people in. I would really love to see some brands take a step back from the product push and say like, okay, what can we do to add to the foundation of the community itself? Maybe that means we need to reestablish how we do competitions. Maybe and, and approach them differently. Maybe we need to create a board of governance for a competitive league of Kendama that is standardized. I talked a little bit about you this with Sweets Kendama, and, and you and I have talked about this. But if we can nail some of those things down, when we finally hit the scale it button and we pump the Facebook ads, we we blow up the brands, we get Tony Hawk playing, we get whoever touching Kendamas and we just scale. slapping some birds. Yeah, we we literally just like can push Kendama. We just don't have enough of the foundation yet for the scaling phase to really hit the 10x factor. I like how you mentioned marketing and uh, like there's some some aspects of marketing because I was going to relate it out back to marketing and this is a specialty of yours because that's what you went to school for. Um, but uh, ultimately, we do a good job of marketing within internally into our uh, into our community, but essentially like you're saying that third party media and third party engagement that and creation that we need to to use is a a fundamental part of marketing ourselves out to the rest of the world to make ourselves appealing yeah. so that we grow so that we're accessible so that yeah. people want it so that we can actually scale it because yeah. all we're doing is we're currently just staying internally and we're, we're marketing Marketing but but that's stuff. also important. It, it is like, important. It absolutely helps us stay very yeah, consistent. Yeah, and to give like a really but we need to grow outwards. Yeah, and a really strong shout out to Kenoma Institute because what they're doing there and Josh Grove by creating class based systems to help people progress is exactly what we be we are needing in mm -hmm. the community. We need more of that kind of content to help people integrate into the space to create the because because like okay if I'm a new player coming into this community and I go on Instagram and search of Kendama I'm going to turn away instantly because it's so overwhelmingly complex to me right now that I don't know how to approach it as a beginner hmm. aside from like big cups it's overwhelming. It's yeah, even the name. I remember starting, and I was like, I can't believe there's names for grips. Like there's Sarah yeah, grip, there's Ken grip. It's there's very what? educationally heavy and very complexity heavy because mm -hmm. of the, the complexity of tricks. It's like you think you know how to play, but like then you're like, oh, this is called like a whip whap, or no, 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 no. Like, like, you know, Tio taught me the difference between swap and trade, and I was already a year in, and I had no different, like yeah. no idea because we don't have any like solidified yeah. nomenclature for a trick book or any standard. Yeah, but we get some basics. Yeah, but the problem that I see is like we see the generation of people that have like learned the 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 thor the the source the, 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 the source of Kanama verbatim and and the problem that I see is like we don't know how to teach Kanama to new people very well. And really Sweets Kanamas and Kanama Institute are really the front runners of trying to integrate new players in and I think you know, by far, you know, and, and, you know, maybe they receive some flack from the inner workings of the Kenoma community, but by far, they're the most outwardly focused Kenoma brand in the community by bringing new people in, by creating Kenomas that are accessible, by creating learning tools, like their, their trick tutorials by Kenoma Institute with what Josh is doing. They're making Kenoma more accessible. And so they, I think, are really heading away on nailing it before we scale it. Mm -hmm. And I think they're probably doing it generally the best in the Kenoma. Well, to the highest quality. Yeah. yeah. For sure. And I think we can just be doing that better across the board. If yeah, everyone like, pitched in, right? Yeah, that, that's all I'm saying is like we can all take ownership in that. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm helping with that. Yeah, you're doing your own part in a different way. Yeah. yeah, by building a deeper foundation for not the new players, but like how do we keep old players in and reestablish mindsets so that we can help equip the next generation? Definitely. And I, I, like I understand where you're saying that too, because I've seen older players 
feel like they've checked out from Dom, especially with the new gen style and all yeah. of these different things. They're like, oh, but I don't do that. Like, I they like feel to pushed do, out. Holes. They feel pushed out because it's so different. It's so whack and it's so. Well, I feel pushed out, man. I see these new kids in Canada. Stay rolling. pushed out. I need to catch up to you. <laughs> like, I'm not even that OG, but I see it, and I like I watch these pros that have like grinded to make this this game what it is today. Now feeling inadequate as players, and they're just watching this new generation take over them, and they have to go. I have to make that choice whether or not I'm stoked for that, or I feel like that I've been you know stolen from, or that something's been taken from me. And, and I think we have to evaluate, you know, where where's our posture, and I hope that we focus on the bigger picture as OG players or as whatever you want to call us. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm I'm kind of I'm a nomad hybrid, hybrid. I live a hybrid player. We'll just call you hybrid from now yeah. on. <laughs> you. Partially electric gas car. <laughs> it's like the, the pre-Tesla. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that gives a little bit of a picture of my perspective on it. And I think it's a like generalized perspective. I don't know if I'm fully accurate on it and like totally open to the people in the comment section being like, yo, this guy's whack. Uh, but, you know, this is from my, this is like a collection of the wealth of the, the interviews that I've had on the review that have really shaped my perspective. And I don't think I'm fully accurate on most things, but I think with where I've sat in the chair of having these conversations, I've begun to really appreciate the broader narrative of what's happened in Kanama. Mm -hmm. And I think other companies like, or other third party media agencies like the Dominators of Bevel's Advocate would, would sympathize. We have this seat that we get to sit on and watch all of the companies progress at the same time and be inside those conversations. And I think it's just really interesting, the perspectives that we have. And I like I hope more people take the opportunity to do third party stuff because the amount of like learning that I have undertaken this year from brand owners is insane. The, the amount of knowledge that I can't share that is in my mm. head about what's going on in the Kendama community is whack. It's wild. I've like, I, I joke about it, but I probably hold more secrets in the Kendama community than anyone else or maybe not anyone else, not but, anyone else, but, but like in that upper echelon job. of like how much I know about what's going on in all the different brands. Privy to much information. And, and I take that really seriously. Like I, I appreciate that and I appreciate my role and it just gives me some humility to say there are things happening in the world of Kendama that the general public does not know mm -hmm. and they don't appreciate. And I think sometimes what I see, and this is going on a totally different rant. Well, sometimes I see like newer players or players that don't see the bigger picture coming down on companies and like r ragging on them because they're not doing enough or they're not doing this. And it's like, do you understand how much time it takes for a brand to make a pivot or to make a change or do something? And do you have any idea that they actually are hearing you and listening to you and they are productively trying to integrate change into what they're doing? And we just like keep harping on them. Man, we need to take a step back and see the bigger picture. Hmm. There's and we don't know the internals. No, we don't. And, and sure, we can get mad at a brand for being like, eh, okay, they could just tell us. But that actually isn't always helpful because then well, they also have their business strategy. Yeah, they have their business strategies. They have to, yeah, there's just things that like some of them are public companies. No, I don't think any of them are public. None of them are public companies. No, no. Okay. They'd have to have an IPO. Yeah. No, I, I'm guessing I, I would have imagined that like Sweets was public or something like that. No, not publicly traded. They're all private, private okay. entities. But nonetheless, they have their individual shareholders that they have responsibilities yeah. to and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's more complicated than people think. Absolutely. It, coming from a business perspective, from both of us having been, been to business school, we understand that. But for a lot of people, it's it's not something that comes straight to mind or is, yeah. is acutely aware of. Um, so speaking of like all of that third party content, you now have a YouTube channel, not the one that I was mentioning earlier yeah. in this uh, podcast that we we're talking here, but you now have a official um, the Cafe Cafe Kendama YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, are there any plans of doing things like suites or like Kendama Institute, as you mentioned, are there any plans of doing things like that on your, um, profile? I don't know if you want to mention I know that you and I have had some talks about some, some cool ideas. Um, yeah, that's the way. So, um, Ken 101 is a series that I'm beginning to theorize and build out and I've released the first episode of it and you know, it was just done in a rush and, and it turned out okay. But really what it is, is a series that I want to develop of the, the things that I think people in the Kendama community should know, or like how to's or lessons that aren't about Kendama it's, itself. So mm -hmm. I, I put up an episode called how to get sponsored or, uh, yeah, how to get sponsored by a Kendama brand or something like that. I, I don't remember the exact title, but that was the principle of it yeah. and talking about it from the mindset and the principles of sponsorship from both an influencer marketing perspective 
and from a brand perspective, like why, why do brands choose to sponsor players? Like, is it just because they're giving back to what the do you community? bring to the table? It, Cause it's not that, okay, sure. There's a piece of it that the brands are giving back to the community, but you have to understand that it's actually a, a profitable thing for brands to do for sponsoring players. And it's not, Oh, it's if, to their benefit. 100%. It's, it's a positive return on ad spend or return on ad or investment. So when, when you think about it, it's like, as a brand, as an influencer marketing specialist, this is what I do for a living. So I, I pay people to make posts on behalf of our brand or send them free product to make posts. And it's like, okay, calculate that cost. If I give you a hundred dollars worth of product and you share about it to your thousand followers and you have a very engaged following and let's say three people buy because of your influence that I wouldn't have had otherwise. It's like, okay, I've made $300. I made a three row as on, on that spend that I put into giving you free product or whatever. Mm. That's why brands ultimately at the end of the day, see the profitability structure of why, why they want to sponsor players is because it brings a positive return on their investment. And maybe it's not always in just money in, it could be in PR, it could be in engagement, it could be in likes, fall, whatever the metric of success that they're looking for is why they ultimately are sponsoring players. It's not just because they want to sponsor players. Because yeah, they're not no, sponsored like I mean, like if, if you're not someone who's engaged with well in the community or liked and you they give you a pro mod and no one buys your pro mod, is it gonna really be beneficial no, that, to them? No, 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 not at all. Exactly. So there are lots of other factors that are um, very, very determined like yeah. determinant uh, word is escaping. Deterministic I can't deterministic. Say. Deterministic. There you go. Um very deterministic in the sense of what goes into sponsorship that's way deeper than what people think like a lot of people think it's very like superficial in terms of like the tricks and stuff like that and yes if you're a unique extremely unique player in terms of your creativity or your style or your tech or whatever it is like say you're adrian yeah um and you're one of a kind then yeah no matter what you do you're going to be a benefit but you generally have to have more than just that yeah and i mean i've talked about this a lot on multiple episodes of podcasts and i I don't need to rehash the whole thing but hammered it down but Ultimately, um, Ken 101 as a YouTube series is going to be talking about those sorts of concepts behind it. It's like, okay, how do you build a Kenoma business? Mm -hmm. Uh, what, how do you run an event? How do you you run a podcast? Yeah. How do you run, what goes into running the review? Talking about the economics and the finances of of podcasts, the show, the YouTube, I want to do a series or a video eventually, like how much money do I make from Kendama? Mm-hmm. Not in a like, oh, I want to show people how much money I make and you know, it's not, no, it's just not give them much. a realistic but, uh, perspective. It's yeah. like the people that make like the videos on it's like how much money, how much I money make does YouTube channel? pay me yeah. for having 500,000 subscribers exactly at, in and, 2020. And because it's educational and it's helpful and people love getting into the nosiness of that stuff and it's good content. And so I always yeah, do it's that. It's just educational. Point. Yeah. It's super interesting. I mean, I'm not one for that kind of stuff. And I actually watched a couple videos like that the other day, just out of simple curiosity. Yeah. It's super interesting stuff. And I love watching this stuff. I, I, so like, okay, another hobby, I love financial investments and stuff like that. So I've watched a lot of like financial YouTubers, uh, Graham Stephan, Andre Zik and, uh, Bia Heza are three that I, I watch a lot of generally. I haven't watched a ton recently, but I love watching them break down their portfolios of how they make their money and the different income streams that they have from their investments to the businesses, to real estate, to stock trade, whatever they do. Mm-hmm. And I love that stuff. And so I want to kind of do that with Kanama one day down the road, you know, maybe in 2022, I'll do like how much money I made from the review and, and Cafe Kanama in 2021. Yeah. We'll see. That would be really cool. Let me know down in the comments if that's something you'd want to see. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> um, so Ken 101, anything else aside from Ken 101 that you're aiming on doing? Um, trick tutorials no i don't think stuff so like that or like uh, or is it mostly just like still very like um how do i how do i put it third degree relative subjects yeah it's hard to say i know you and i talked about doing trick tutorials and and they're a, they're a possibility but i the more i think about it it's like i want to keep cohesion in everything that i'm doing to really create a visionistic brand where everything I'm doing falls under that same narrative of I want to bring people behind the camera. Mm-hmm. And doing trick tutorials kind of d- defeats the purpose of that. Yeah. To I me, mean, you can find a way of segmenting it in. Sure. But it, it, if you're trying to have like an overarching theme and really solidify and maintain that theme, it is good to stay singular to that. Yeah. Even just in like how you approach, because then when people, 
you, you, I always think about how people would talk about what I do. And I care more about how other people represent me than how I represent myself. And what I mean by that is I, I hope that I'm so clear in what I do that when you tell someone about what I do, you have a very clear picture of what I do and you're able to communicate that in a sentence and say like, oh yeah, Adam is the go-to source for behind the can content in the community. If you want to learn anything about etiquette or whatever it is in the Kanoa space, he's the best person to go to. He doesn't focus on tricks or tutorials or anything like that, but he's the best resource for that. And I want to focus on that one thing and just do that so good mm. and be the premier resource for it. Mm. Which is a really good goal to have. And it's a really, it's, it's a concrete and defined goal, which will make it even easier for you to make, not easier to achieve it, but easier for yeah. you to pick out each step that you need to figure out what you need to do next to yeah. then achieve in, in the long run. But yeah, and then uh, the YouTube will probably host other content like edits and stuff from people. The I, you know, people ask me this every now and then if I'd ever sponsor people, and I think eventually um, sponsor me. Sp sponsor Kareem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it down in the comments, boys and girls. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like sponsorships definitely something I've considered in kind of that tandem partnership with Soul Kanamas, mm -hmm. looking at maybe doing like a Soul Kanamas Canada piece here and branching that out. It might be under the banner of Cathy Kanama, it might be under the banner of Soul Kanamas Canada, I don't know. Um, but sponsorship is an opportunity, but I don't want to approach sponsorship the same way that other brands do it. I love what Kanama France has done mm -hmm. as a as a distributor that has created ambassadors and content that is just unique. Mm -hmm. They aren't like any other distributor. They are their own eight like production. They, they're they They're awesome. Dude, I, I freaking love what they do. And yeah, I know you're ready to move there. I know I'm going to book a flight right after this. No, We're but, going together. Uh, you can't leave me behind. I can't. I can't let you steal my European friends. <laughs> I got their money. We can all be friends. No, no, no. Isn't there like a song that says, "Can't we all be friends?" Or something? Why can't we, we all be friends? Something like that. You got a friend <laughs> in me. So, I just like what they're doing. I I want to replicate some of what they're doing and bring on people that can create more content that is more behind you can. Exactly. So I don't want to sponsor people that are just the best at tricks. I don't want to sponsor the next KWC. Okay, it would be great to have the next KWC winner as a as that a would player, but, miss a benefit for but sure. I would way rather sponsor a guy like TJ Ken Cult when he was doing his YouTube content and videos, uh, doing whether or not it was unboxings or whatever. Some doing, of the highest quality content we've seen. Some of the best quality content. He's a guy I'd want on my team hmm. because he's doing something unique in the world that can bring value that's deeper than being another guy who does crazy tricks. Yeah, because we're already very saturated in that. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can look at, at any amateur and you can find already that same level of pro play there too. Yeah, so I want to build Catholic and Nama into being more of a media hub or a media agency in the Kanama world. So is, are you trying to pull on someone like TJ because you hate editing and you just don't want to do it and get them to it's do like it for you? Is that like yeah. the low key the reason? Yeah, low key. <laughs> I, there, there's just a whole bunch of stuff like that that I think would be dope. Like, <laughs> what is it that you have against editing? <laughs> uh, I'm so instant gratification focused. Even when it comes to this podcast, I record my episodes on live because it's convenient, and then I just take the audio and put it on the podcast, and this I add like a, a pain for you. a front and end cap to it, and 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 that's just it's easy, it's quick, and. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there, that this was the case. So Jaren, a long time ago, J Jippler Doodles on on Instagram. Shout out Jippler. He's the guy who introduced me to Kendama. Yeah, he put up a post or a story once upon a time showing like three triangles of an influencer, mm -hmm. like the three prongs of like how to be an influencer, and, and you kind of need to have two of them. And one of them was production quality, like having high quality content in terms of visually aesthetically pleasing, having a personality, and then uh, entertaining. I think. No, what was the third one? Or highly skilled, I think. Highly skilled. It was like um, being an expert, personality, and quality, and, and editing. It were basically the three prongs. And as long as you have two of them, you're probably going to be doing decent. And I just disregard the editing as all. And, <laughs> and, I, and I try to bring the personality and the like expertise in a specific category. That Absolutely. I and I think that that has been what's carried me through. And I'm like, okay, I can kind of just like bypass the editing thing. But eventually, the long-term hope is if this scales and grows, I can pay to have someone, someone edit. do the editing so it adds that third piece in. And the next thing we know, it's like this goes from this 
to this. Get you and it's in Jacob a Jacob Watson here, some kind of guy. Yeah, but like that's the power of community, though, is when you can bring other people into what you're doing and create a community that is surrounding it. That's mint. That's and that's really that added value that you were talking about earlier of having those people that you can pull in and then really yeah, gain you can just create great content, that's different, yeah. right? And, like, like I, you and I both agree on this. Nativ has some of the best content in terms of like visual, visual editing. Um, yeah, we can watch it over and over and over yeah. again, and that's the difference between like engagement, and that's the difference between longevity, and that's the difference between marketing out externally, and all of those different mm -hmm. winning factors that actually push you places and push Kendama places. Um, so. Where do you think Kendama is going to evolve considering all of these topics that we've just talked about? Like we've talked about third party engagement and third party media. We've talked about tricks. We've talked about the current modality of, of the Instagram community, like the Instagram community, the Kendama community as a whole, um, how we've bridged a lot of gaps. Where do you think Kendama is going from here now? Yeah, so once we nail some of those things, I think we're going to see a scale, but what are the things that I think we need to nail is competition, and what does competition look like? We've done a great job this year of transitioning to doing online events. I think that's been really, really a big win. Under quite a lot of stress, of course. Yeah, totally. Uh, but when we begin to go back into doing public domain stuff in, in the out, outdoors and open and event venues and stuff, I think we're going to begin to see a transition of competing styles from just the standard open division that we are all used to and maybe freestyle to beginning to incorporate some of the tools that Yo-Yo has created, like 1A Yo-Yo, 2A Yo-Yo, 3A, 4A, 5A, where there's actually different categories of the competition itself for freestyle. So what if there's a freestyle event that is actually two kittens, or it's kaiju, or it's sumo, like it's different sizes, or stickies, non-stickies, or whatever it is, or there, there can be whole different categories of how things are competed. Mm -hmm. A, a ranking system, I think, to incorporate into. I the was world. just going to bring that up because you and I have talked about this countless times. I over and yeah, over again. and I beat it to death on the on the Matt Sweets interview yeah. as well. So like, I remember you guys talking about that. that. They can definitely listen to that. But there, just to like highlight it a tiny bit, just like there's an opportunity to create different like systems like we see in like online gaming and other things like that too that open up a world of possibilities. They might not be the right yeah. ecosystem by any sense, but like. It's, it's a possibility that we can explore. Well, I, I, yeah, I think so. I think one of the tools, and this is me drawing on my like World of Warcraft experience and online gaming experiences, there's a very clear rating system that's often MMR, broken, yeah. but it's MMR it's or LP or whatever you want to call it from whatever game you've played. Matchmaking rating is basically yeah. the principle. And for your ELO, uh, what does ELO stand for? It's on League? Uh, League whatever. Doesn't ELO matter. is just... It, you know what it is. It's, Doesn't it's matter. your ranking, essentially. But there needs to be a competitive system, or I, I think, not need maybe, but I would love to see a competitive system where there was a rating system that every match that you won and lost would drop or boost your score. Hey gang, Adam here again. We had some more technical difficulties, so let me say a huge thank you once again to all of you who are here listening to this episode. If you are enjoying the review or you're enjoying this episode in particular, we invite you to head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review on the review. This really helps to boost the reviews of reach via podcast platforms, and it can also help get the podcast into new ears all around the world and bring Kendama everywhere, because that's what it's all about, is spreading the love of Kendama through the warmth of coffee. Thank you so much for joining us in this special anniversary episode, and we will get right back to it. All right, so we're back. <laughs> we had some more technical difficulties. Um, and my camera ran out of battery because we're gonna put a pay, uh, donation link down below so that Kareem can buy extra batteries. You know how expensive Sony batteries are? They're like a hundred dollars. We're asking off. fans of the show to support the show. By I'm all Kareem. for it. Please send your dollars this way. Your boy needs multiple batteries. But really, this is all Adam's fault because he plugged in my computer, my 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 wall charger for the for the camera to an extension cable that doesn't output enough, so we mm -hmm. ran out of battery. It's all his fault. Blame him. Anyhow, we did experience some, some difficulties. 
we were talking about matchmaking system. Yeah. Um, we can just like quickly recap off of that and just say like... Lo long story short, here, yeah. here's, here's all I wanted to say about matchmaking is I think when we can establish a better norm for ranking players to say someone is definitively better than other people because of their win-loss records against the... Some qualitative metric. metric. Yeah, some, some qualitative metric aside from, oh, this person won this event and that event, but didn't have a great system for knowing, you know, whether or not their path to winning was harder than other people's and because the people they ranked up against and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think if we had an MMR based system for players in competitions and we had a standardized competition set, we would just end up seeing a better robust system for ranking players. Yeah. Similar to like League of Legends or Absolutely. whatever. Yeah. That, that, that's the long story. Yeah. Short. Yeah. Um, so we're going to wrap this up pretty quick here. Like it's been a really lengthy interview already. We've been cruising. But we've been having a really great time. Thank you for all of us who have been listening, or for all of you, all of us, for all of you who have been listening along with us. And thank you, Adam, for again, having me on, on the show with you and allowing me to, to, to do this with you. It's been a real pleasure and opportunity. Um, but yeah, we'll finish off with a few last questions and we'll wrap it up. And we'll Here we got some Patreon it. ones. We'll, we'll yeah, so we got the Patreon Support questions. The Patreon fan. We're going to do those first, then I'll ask a couple, la a couple quick last ones and then we'll We'll be done. Yes, sir. If you are a patron, thank you first off very much for supporting the Cafe Kendama Enterprise, whatever we want to call this thing. Uh, seriously, you guys are the realist. And if you want to join the Patreon, it's just five dollars a month American, and you get behind the scenes access and special contribution to episodes like this, where it is Patreon only questions exactly. and whatever questions Cream came up with. He's not on the Patreon, so we give him a pass for this one. I get lucky. What can I say? My homies love me. All right, so speaking of the Patreons, let's move on to their questions. Um, Matthew Taylor asked, just some random questions. Um, when was the last time you took a week off of coffee? Oh, okay, so last- A whole week, bro. I, I took a whole month. month. I took a whole month. A month? Yeah, let me say Say word. No, I'm serious. Uh, last year, about Christmas time, it was just before Christmas. I had been getting insane stomach pains and I thought I was developing an ulcer. And so we were testing out some things. Because it's very acidic. Yeah, it wasn't that. It, it's stress related pain yeah. in my stomach. I like had contracting. What I don't know the science behind it, but whatever it was, it hurt. And so we were testing it out to find out if it was ulcer related because apparently like there's in my family, someone has uh, ulceritis, something collapsed. There's a name for it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what it is anymore. I don't have it. Uh, but I had to went and go off coffee for a month to reduce the acidic intake that I was uh, mm. experiencing. And I was like, what if I never can drink coffee again? I actually was like pretty beat up about it. I, like, I imagine I complained you're, about it. you would be. I was pretty sour. I would be butthurt if I couldn't drink any more iced tea. Yeah. Like it would be life, life detrimental, life ending. So Matthew, one year ago, I took a month off. Whole month. I'm proud of you. I'm very proud of you. Um, and he also asks, is there a kendama you would trade a week off of coffee for? So could you acquire Ooh. a kendama, some specific, really special kendama by giving up coffee for a week? Ooh, okay, maybe, may, okay, two, maybe two options. A hand turn custom from Terra Kendama. I would maybe do it for because those things are very expensive. expensive. Yeah, it's so if I could get one for free in exchange for a week off coffee, I think I could do it. Yeah. It'd be hard. Uh, I'd right, also like to do it for the other Native uh, coffee mod, so oh, that I could have the package. Not the graphite. Well, that too. That would be. That was one that I. Oh man, I wanted that so bad. Nativ, send your boy the graphite too. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or send it to me. Send me everything. You send already all your dollars. You already got a mod. <laughs> send me one. Let me try out your thingies. Like I, I could do a couple stall tricks here and there. So <laughs> those would be the mods, probably. All right. Uh, he has quite a few questions, so... Yeah, yeah, um, Or bounce, bounce to someone else, come back to him, whatever yeah. you want. You do. Um, Matthew continues to ask, is there any particular tricks that you're gunning for right now? Ooh. And this is actually one of the questions I was going to ask. Is there any tricks that, like, any dream tricks that you're looking towards lacing ever? Yeah, uh, there is. But you want to keep that secret. No, not at all. People, um, people can't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of, like, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm the worst when it comes to, like, trick conceptions because I don't write things down. I don't, I don't log <laughs> true. tricks. Adam, this is a, this is a true story. Adam will literally look at me and be like, oh, you know what you should do? <laughs> or you know what would be cool? And then completely comes up with an idea and just, like, tries it out for a few minutes and then forgets about it. <laughs> yeah. But one, one of the tricks, so, uh, 
Isaac from Lotus Kanama was, I think, the first one, or he was the one that introduced me to it, but I've, you know, since then done it a lot, uh, is pull up swivel, sling, swivel, uh, to spike he had hit originally. And I was like, oh, that's a cool concept. This is when I was getting into swivels for the first time. Well, I had been doing swivels for a long time. I was like one of the original guys who did swivel four corners. I don't know if anyone else had done it, but I pulled it out on MKO 2018 on the freestyle stage, which I was not prepared for. <laughs> I was very inadequate to be on that stage. Oh, no. That's, nonetheless, that's a tough stage to be on. I haven't even been on it. Yeah. I can only imagine the pressure. Nonetheless, I learned that trick three or so years ago. The like swivel, swivel, boom, boom, and then swivel spike. Uh, so I've been really into swivels for a while, but seeing Isaac do this trick, I was like, okay, I want to try and do this. And so I learned how to do it to spike pretty quick. It didn't take me like a long time. It took me like maybe less than a day, a couple of an hour or two. And then all of a sudden I started learning to like pull up and I found out that I could pull it to bird. bird. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, so I'll pull it to bird. And then since then I've been like, okay, what if I can get double sling to bird? To bird. So I've gotten that and I want to get a uh, triple sling to bird. So that's the next step, that's but tough. it's hard. It's really tough. It's, I hardly have enough time to get the double and you have to have such a good Kanama and your finger gets yeah, wrapped. This string the gets, I, so I did, I, I've done uh, actually yeah. both those tricks for my 28 tricks later this year. I did the uh, swivel, late, uh, swivel late sling, swivel back to spike. Yeah. And I've done also the swivel trip late sling. Um, just just down thing. spike. Yeah, and I've done, I've that done that. Trip yeah. down I think sling, I've done a quad. Like I find trip quad down, like down slings are much easier to sling for me than reg slings. Yeah, they are. I think um, so. I like that rotation direction, but this string becomes such the a string huge gets wrapped around problem. your so so quickly. It's either that day I'm getting it or I'm not getting it. It's <laughs> yeah. just luck. The string control is out of my out of my lead. Yeah. So there's a few variations using that that I want to work on. So I want to get like uh from swivel sling bird mm -hmm. then uh, over the valley swivel sling, sling back bird valley. and then swivel sling back to spike is the hope but i have had a really hard time it's really hard to do that trick from bird yeah also without handing it too yeah it's it's just like you because your hands are so, so close, close. And yeah. anytime you do any sort of a swivel trick like that you, you like you can so easily graze so easy, yeah. That um, that's why I don't like doing four corners in special grip because I yeah. always end up touching it. So I just prefer to do it and count. Yeah. It. So that would be one of the tricks that I really want to do. Um, Jacob Watts uh, did this trick already, but I was really into harder flips for a bit. So oh, harder yeah. flip and then insta harder flip back yeah. is a trick I wanted to get. I've been grinding for five tap uh, back to inward lunar. I've been grinding on a whole bunch of random stuff. The Bryson Lee level 12 full taps. the full tap flips from i think kwc 2016 or 17 yeah. is one of the dream tricks i've been grinding for for a really long time and i've gotten it's so close trick. recently and i just want that trick that's like that's the trick that when i hit it i'll be like okay i'm really this was the trick i've always been aiming for for a long time it's kind of one of those confirmation tricks that you've got to a certain skill level yeah absolutely so uh, i was doing and, uh, under your suggestion i was doing that trick recently with, with the push tap variation and i have the cushion it's version home now and i used to struggle with yeah. that so i'm so it close. is it is actually deceptively tough after that first like you do the back foot push tap suit or, or your regular you think it's easy yeah it's super easy <laughs> Your toss after, not too bad. It takes a little getting used to, but yeah. not too bad. But to go insta again after a toss without tossing again and just to like mentally make yourself stop and like just cush tap it regularly yeah. is so complex. Yeah. It's very totally. tough. It's very humbling trick. Yeah. Anyways, that, that's the answer. Yeah. Um, um, let's jump to Justin then hop back to Matthew after. Justin Horvers, uh, another Patreon supporter, asks, where do you think Kandama is going to take you? That's a really good question. So, you know, I love my job that I get to do outside of Kanama, uh, but it would be really cool if I could dedicate everything that I'm doing to Kanama one day. And if the opportunities that present themselves through Cafe Kanama can enable that, that'd be awesome. Uh, I can see Kanama always playing a role in my life, both as someone who plays it, someone that's involved in the community, and hopefully as like an income generating machine as well that helps me to be more invested because I do believe like, not in a capitalistic, like overly capitalistic sense, but like if we can get more people on the Kendama payroll, we're just gonna get more out of Kendama. Oh, absolutely. If more people can afford to put more time towards it, because that's the problem, we lose so many adults in the Kendama community because they need to prioritize their careers. And, and oh yeah, you have families, responsibilities, yeah. just, work. Just whatever. imagine, imagine what could be done if more people were able to live off of Kendama and the amount of progression that we'd see with a guy like Ben Harold who took 
a year or whatever it was, however long he took or still is to fully dedicate to Kendama mm-hmm. and the growth progression that that, that enabled. Mm-hmm. If we can get more people doing that, that'd be insane. And so when you achieve that full-time thing, and uh, please hire me, make your major <laughs> parks option. I want to make Kendama full-time too. Um, Justin also asked, if you were stranded on an island, what three Kendamas are you taking with you? Okay, so recently I have been really loving the Native. Uh, I've never played one before, so it's really top of mind for me. So that one for stalls, I think would be dope. Yeah, um, it really is crazy for stalls. I tried it out today and it's nuts. Super never exciting. had to lick the bevel. Yeah, probably some sort of soul one up. Of course. And I might bring the Mayflower too. I've been really jiving with it. It's, yeah, it's really, really, really nice. I got to try that today for me as well, and it was a really good experience. Yeah. I'll have to get one from Jacob. The New Lace Mayflower is dope. But I might swap one of them out for some kaiju, just for just utility. Just for the fun of it. Yeah. No, for the utility. It's oh, like, so you can like beat some insects yeah, on if, the island or something, or like some gorilla. Insects, but yeah, what if, what if some creature comes after me? I, and it's bigger firewood. So it's like it's bigger firewood. So in case I need to sacrifice a dollar, yeah, I'm just like, saying like one night of fire. Or you can you can all serve as a paddle. I mean, until the water logs itself. Well, no, it still would have resistance to the water. You can use it for fishing. Yeah, for clubbing a club <laughs> clubbing some, some seals. No. Oh my gosh! No, so this is an R-rated podcast. <laughs> Cops are coming after you. Never. Um, okay, so we love the seals. We got you. Yeah, no, we don't want to be no seals. We're, we we love animals. I'm a cat person personally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> get out of here. Leave your own house. Go uh, go home. I don't like cats. Um, I just like dogs. Justin also asks, "What makes you happy with life?" Or I guess, "What makes you happy in life?" It's an interesting question because I don't like the the phrasing of what makes you happy. I would prefer like what you choose to be happy about. But he says what makes you happy in life. Having a genuine impact on someone's life that changes their direction in a more positive way. Uh, what I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, actually. So someone asked me recently, like, what do you, what, what is like a goal of your life or like, what, what would be the most beautiful piece of your life if you could like capture it? And for me, it'd be if, at, at my funeral, when I die, it, I'm just surrounded by a number of people that would never know each other, that they all show up with their own unique stories of how I impacted their life in a unique way. And all of these people have gone on to live great lives and have gone on to achieve great things because of me getting to play a role in pushing them in that direction or, or showing them that they're more than what they think they are. Don't make me cry. I don't want to think about you dying. Let me die first, okay? <laughs> My knees are already on the way out before yours are. It, it sounds sadistic, but like I, I long, I, I hope that I'm surrounded at my funeral with to die from no, no, just like with stories of sure. of ways that I impacted people, and for people to like be overwhelmed by the amount of other people that I was able to impact without them ever knowing, because I, I don't care whether or not people know what I did for other people. I don't, I don't care about the clout. I don't want to be known for that, but. At my funeral, I hope that, you know, all the people that may have dismissed what I've done in my life then get to see all these stories come to life and say, like, no, Adam was this to me. Adam was able to set me on this direction. Adam Adam saw me when I needed help and came in and, and was that help. Even though I can be a bit of a pain in the butt for people, I'm, <laughs> I do it out of a deep, deep love to see that yeah. someone can be more than what they think they are. No, absolutely. And to challenge And people. I mean, I, I shake my head nodding in jokes. He knows that I appreciate all of his hard love and it's not hard love. It's really honestly just, he knows how to push people and he knows, he knows what to look for. <laughs> but and welcome to the deep end of uh, the review. <laughs> um, last question from Justin Horvers. Um, what do you think is your biggest place for growth in life? Ooh. I, I've always said humility. I can be very confident, uh, but, and, and that just comes from like the way that I approach things. It's not actually that I'm actually that confident. It's not I, arrogance. It's just confidence. Well, I, I, I had always been mis, mis, con, you know, misrepresented a lot in my life growing up as like being argumentative or whatever. And it's in, in some regards true. But the reason that I'm that way is more because of the way that I approach questions and, and answer things. And, and I love like, and obviously the, the terminology of the devil's advocate gets hated on a lot, but I actually see its place in the world. I see its place in the world of learning and asking 
the hard questions of getting down to the foundation of something and then realizing what that foundational truth is to, to the answer to the question, then rebuilding on top of that. Mm -hmm. And my approach to solving a question or answering something is oftentimes taking the stance of something that I don't fully understand and trying to defend it until it's broken. And then I go down to the deeper layer. Okay, so now that this has been beaten, let me try this. And until you finally get down to the root cause of something and you're like, okay, I think I have a pretty good grasp on this. Now, oftentimes people don't love that approach because you can be a turd throughout that process by holding opposing arguments to something that you may or not even agree with. And, and that can be off-putting for some people. And for me, it's like, okay, I want to learn to be more approachable in conversation, but I also want to own that part of me as well. You still want to have those genuine conversations that fulfill you. Because I've seen the value. You don't of being, want to change yourself. For I see, yeah, I see the value of being a devil's advocate in some capacity because I think when we are open to challenging things and by opening myself to holding an argument of something I don't even believe in, whether or not it's political or relational, or spiritual, whatever it is, uh, by being able to take my perspective and step into someone else's and, and own it and, and hold that and defend it as though I believe it, even though I don't necessarily or may not even know if I believe it, I think it's so empowering to me. And so I love it. So I want to learn to grow into that more and just own that part of me because I think I've been afraid of it and I've tilted back and forth between that where when I grew up, I was very argumentative and I would do that maybe too much and I didn't know how to like tone that down. Yeah, there's a balance, of course. And I've probably shifted more away from that recently where I'm afraid to to hold a, a strong opinion and to be combative in that yeah, way. The world is so judgmental nowadays as well. Yeah, so it doesn't help. It's definitely a fear I have. but It's very nexus against us. Yeah, and, and I, like, I'm afraid of saying things sometimes because I, I just... Yeah, I'm trying to create a positive place and a positive platform, and but I think there's sometimes a place to to play that role a little bit and be be slightly antagonistic because I think that can lead to some of the greatest discoveries and the greatest learnings. Absolutely, so. we've had many many conversations like behind closed doors as just for as for yeah. friendship. We've had many 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 conversations that are fundamentally based in that yeah. practice. So, anyways, that's my biggest area of growth is owning more of who I am yeah. and being comfortable with it and not hiding from it. Mm. Okay. And so back to Matthew Taylor, um, he says, uh, what can the condomic or sorry, what can the condomic community, uh, do to stop losing players, especially when they finish college? So we, we talked about this we a did, little bit. We did yeah. a little bit. So uh, I think more things like what we're doing at the review that are more like, so the review, sure, anyone can approach it at any age, but it's probably mostly geared towards like that 25 year old to 35 year old age range in terms of the content that we end up talking about. Yeah. It's a bit more not it's necessarily mature, it's not but adult it, it, in like the like it's not R rated content, but it's it's mature concepts inclined towards stuff like that as well. They'd I rather hope, go play the Dama maybe. I, so. I hope to paint the review in a picture that's approachable for all ages. Yeah, where anybody can come to it and and grow in it, and whether or not you're younger and you're looking to explore and get better and you know mature yourself into the community, or if you're in that same stage of life as I am, like twenty five years old that hopefully you are taking something and growing from it. Absolutely. And so I hope that platforms like the Review, Dominators, Battles Advocate, other events and stuff start to be more present and help to play a retaining role in the adult category of, of Kinoma, like that 25 to 35 year old age, because I think that's the largest drop off category, but also one of the fastest growing categories in Kinoma too now. Yeah. We're old. It's an old story. <laughs> hey, don't lock me in with you. I'm like, a couple of months younger or something. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I think a year or something. I turned 26 this year. You just turned 20? Oh, it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. Anyhow, we're both old. Um, who would you be willing to pay to do an edit for you? I would Ooh. imagine Jacob Watts. Yeah, Jacob would be cool. I think, ultimately, like, I'd love to go to Europe and oh, I mean, do, Nativ, do something with Nativ. Yeah, if not, Nativ. If not Nativ, Cooper Eddy, because I think he has Cooper some great Eddie. vision when he puts together edits. Mm -hmm. They're very, very well done, and he usually has some bit or thing uh, as a part of it that's super unique, and I love that he Quirky. does that. He's got some quirkiness to it. Colin Hislop would be really cool. I think he's one of the best trick filmers in terms of how he flows with a trick. He's, he's really, really good at capturing the movies. He knows how to... When you like as a Dama player filming a Dama player, you if you understand the composition yeah. of a trick, you understand how to film the trick better. Yeah. The other and Zach Magnuson. He was Zach Magnuson. I his, see that's, that's where I would agree. For me, it would be Nativ and it would be Zach Magnuson. Yeah. Zach Magnuson Pro Edit is I one think of his, my favorite yeah. edits, just visually speaking. Yeah. It'd be, it'd Amen. Just Preach. so well put together. Yeah, I think one of the greatest edits that came out in this past year is his edit it's for a, for a pro announcement. I think bar. it set a new bar of like how high quality. It is. It's like whether or not you are in that camp of people that are like, oh, they need to come up with a new mod at Kusa, 
You can't disregard how great that edit yeah, was. Kusa, hey, I, I, I you want you that can say whatever is the best I thing. wanted that Kanama so bad after watching I it. I still want it, and I've yeah. never played a Kusa to this day. I want that Kanama. Oh, send, send me that Dama. That's the number one inspiration for when I make my edit one. Um, okay, top three unsponsored players. Oh, that's a good question. I, I even saw this one earlier, and I didn't think about it. Oh, oh. Top three unsponsored players. Who was I thinking about when I saw this question? Okay, uh, maybe this doesn't count, but Ben Conte, he's like an ambassador for Canom France. Oh, France. But I just love his love for the game and his like passion, and he's the funnest guy ever. We've had a couple of video calls, and I just really like him. Yeah, he's good energy. I remember watching you guys so much, talk. So much good energy, and he loves the game, and he brings a he's cool genuine. flavor. Yeah, uh, I really like him. In terms Let's of keep these fast so we can make yeah. all these questions in time. Yeah. Uh, that's a tough question. It I, is really tough. I'm gonna say Kareem. Aww. Wow. It's just because you, you live here and I love you, man. I appreciate you. Uh, I love you too. And maybe my third one. There was someone I was thinking about. Probably like Micah Segura or Peter Ramos for their like technical abilities. They're both they're insane. both insane canola players. Absolutely insane. So that'd probably be what I say. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for putting me up there. That that's so good. Because you're the homie. Thing. Thank you. Um, how big is your kendama collection now? We can both answer that for you. I'm, we don't even have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> probably like sixty or seventy kendamas, and I've probably owned over a hundred. I've easily, given away a lot easily. Um, do you get much criticism from family for your devotion to Ken, to Kendama? Is your family supportive, I guess? That's what he's asking. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, I think from my parents and my, my sister, uh, Rachel, who lives here in the city, they, they like really appreciate what I've done and you know, they, they respect it. They see how much I don't know if it. they under always understand like the level of involvement that I have or the role that I play in the community. And I think that sometimes gets undermined and it's whatever my ex they have to family be there to understand it. Yeah. I think the rest of my family probably doesn't know or appreciate, you know, what, what actually it is. And partly I don't try and put it on them. I, I don't want to ask my family to see me as what I'm doing. And if they want to ask and dive in and learn, great. But I don't, no I don't want to force anything or and I don't want them to like feel like they have to see me in some light or like feel like I need to defend myself for what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. It's like, until you play and until you pick up a Konami, you, you just won't understand. understand it until you, yeah, you grasp it for yourself. Until you put your first clip on IG, you won't understand. True. Um, and last question from Matthew. Do you think there will ever be a Kendama Netflix series? <laughs> I don't think so. Hey man, uh, there's. <laughs> but that would be sick. There's man, if you want to start that? I'm in. I'm in to go in with you. Yeah, I doubt there's a Netflix series, but there there very well could be a Kenova documentary, like something a documentary. Like, for stay sure. on your tablet could like that category of that film could be put could in. be put on Netflix yeah. for sure. So, it could go in there like an India class. Yeah, yeah. I just watched a mountain biking edit called. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to forget what it's called, but I watched one recently where they were... They'll come back to you. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter, but I was like, oh, this is dope. I could see something like this in Kenalba being on Netflix one day. Easily possible yeah. with the growth and the expansion. Okay, so now we've covered the Patreon questions. We've got our last few questions from me, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, first off, as a person who only grows a full beard, how do I get a nice-looking goatee like that? Dude, it is not. What do nice I gotta thing. do, man? Nothing. Tell me what's up. You gotta have terrible facial hair growth to grow this. This is awful. I asked. So, for those of you watching this right now, I asked Kareem if I should shave this, and he said, "No, keep it." I was telling him he always looks way better grizzly. I think it looks so bad, so patchy. But you guys uh, hit the like button. Just, <laughs> just, hit, the like just button. hit the like button. I was gonna say, just, just don't hit the just like button if you don't like it, because that's gonna help the algorithm. <laughs> just help. Help. <laughs> Send me beard growth tips. I bought beard oil. It kind of helped, maybe, but uh, you gotta commit. It's like when you cut your hair. You gotta commit to it. I know. I mean, I I want the long hair to come back. Yeah, I mean, it's gross coming. It's coming. We'll see. You got the hat on. Um, 
Also, any plans for the next upcoming brew battle? Anything that you want to mention? Any ideas? Anything that you have yes. in news in regards to that? And will I? Will you put bets on me taking first place this time in 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 uh, that amateur? I, I, I got close. To, no, I got fourth I at my first. Here's my, my key in my relationship ball. with Kareem. Let me tell I'm you, third always, in my freestyle. Always push Kareem down. Diggies. This is this is this is my relationship with Kareem. I always try to push him down. See that he he kicks me while I'm down. I, I put him down so that he can rise up. He really does push me like that. Because Tomorrow. because if you just tell him that he's good, he doesn't try. This is true. He doesn't do anything. He's just like, oh yeah, I'm good. And I was like, okay, well now you suck. <laughs> True. You you have to put the pressure on. Kareem needs that, and and no one else tells him that. Everybody else gives him positive affirmation all day long, and so I have to come along and do the heavy lifting and tell him I'm like, eh. You need you like better. a massage note from the doctor for how hard you carry me on your back. <laughs> that's that's that. You need those aggressive people in your lives every now and then just to tell you that you can do more. So basically, he wants me to win amateur this time. And well, I think you could, but you need to work for it. The same thing. Last time I didn't. Yeah. I, I actually did not practice the tricks at all. I showed up that day. I didn't sleep. I didn't eat any food. I was literally running around with like a yeah. head cut off, and I still managed to get fourth in in uh, yeah. amp. So I was pretty stoked. And yeah. then third in freestyle. Okay. Here. So 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 yeah. To answer your question though, through battle twenty twenty one, we really want to make it happen. Yeah. That's fully intended. Uh, it really ultimately depends on the COVID protocols that come out. If we can make it happen and borders can open, dude, we're sailing this thing to the moon. We're hoping to get. 100 to 200 people coming out to it. We'll keep probably the brackets the same. Same venue, potentially. Yeah. Well, it well, depends, it depends on the size. Because yeah. of COVID loss as well. We might try and move it up earlier in the year so we can do it outdoor and indoor because then be we nice. can block off the, the alleyway of the event venue that we were yeah, at. Yeah, we've got like a lot of tarping or we've got a lot of astroturf that we, we can make advantage of and stuff like that. We've got benches. We've got the Yeah. Landscape. Anyways, all that to say, we'd really like to grow it. Keep it community orientated. It's not about, if you come to Brew Battle this upcoming year and you come in with the expectation that this is a competition, you're right, but it's more. <laughs> it's it's actually less competition, more about the community. It's, a, it's like and a bigger jam. It's a big jam that happens to have prizes. And I want to emphasize that even more by focusing on a pre-day and a post-day of okay. film days. And we, we hope to have done that, but the COVID protocols and stuff, we did do a post-day jam and we did do a pre-day jam. Year, yeah. But yeah, COVID just really throws a wrench into in everything. Moments. Yeah, for, for real. Yeah, but, we, so yeah, well, we'd hope to do a pre pre or post event day in Banff. That's the that's the big piece I want to include. Yeah, we'll and I sure. might try and do a, a coffee led tour of Calgary as like a segment of one of the days. Everyone's just gonna be wired. <laughs> yeah, and, and hopefully next brew battle, if we have pros and people that I want on the review coming out to it. Set this up here and a week just before do that. live review episodes like this. Yeah, you could do some live like shotgun interviews kind of thing like you've seen on YouTube. Yeah, like so I want to create other content, yeah. too, but stuff kind of in that vein of, of content. So mm. that, I was going to ask, if, if COVID allows and border allows, will you be allow, would you be open to allowing like international yeah, uh, of course. attendees? Yeah, absolutely. As long as they Every, draw everything. I would love... my. It would, it I know would, my boy Jacob Watts wants to make it in bad. He I really know, wants know, to make it in. Uh, he was that, desperate dude, this last year. I want people from Europe and Japan to come out to this we thing. I want it to get that big. Yeah, yeah we got to get all of the homies. Yeah, for real. Um, okay, and um, what else do I have here to ask you? What is your astrology sign? I don't... I don't. When are you born? October. October. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what astrology stuff is. I think you might be a Virgo. I don't, I don't Could really, be a Libra. I don't really buy into that That's stuff. That's just interesting. Maybe the people want to know. This is just some interesting <laughs> questions. People get to know you a little bit more. I, but I, no, I just mean like I just don't know what it is because I've never I've never spent time looking at it. Um, hey Siri. What 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 day is your birthday? October twenty. Oh. <laughs> hey Siri, what astrology sign is October twenty eighth? Twentieth. Twentieth. What what day? Okay, well, we'll scrap that. This game didn't help, and you're, you, you need to articulate your numbers better. <laughs> I said 20. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, so if you could go to any event right now, imagining that Catch they can have... I already knew it. Uh, <laughs> favorite comfort food? Butter chicken. Yeah, from where? In Calgary, from where? Which place? The new place that you were telling me about, or... I haven't had their butter chicken yet at the new place. At Chennai Spices, it's really close to where I live. 
uh, tamarind right now, just tamarind because right that's now. the one that I've had their butter chicken and it's really good. Okay. Also, probably like a lamb korma is actually probably my favorite dish there, but butter chicken, I make butter chicken all the time at home. It's not we like had amazing chicken. butter chicken the last time when we had dinner together. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, I do love butter chicken. Um, if What language would you pick? If you could learn a language right now, what language would you pick? Ooh. If China takes over the world, Mandarin would be really helpful. Indi <laughs> India, guys, thinking about world domination. <laughs> in India also has like one of the most dominant languages in the world, but it's so many dialects that it's it would be like you'd have to pick one, and I can't do that. So probably Mandarin for for like the broader political world, um, but Japanese would be dope. So I could have conversations with also you could watch anime things. without subtitles. I could, yeah. But like it also gives you like really good practice for tracking. So like. Subtitles kind of not bad. Okay, you, okay, you saw that. <laughs> that's why, that's why uh, Kanama players that watch anime are better because their eyes are just so used to watching the screen and the subtitles. The screen crack the code. Just watching the Tom and Ken, Tom and Ken, Tom and My last, uh, sorry, I have two, two yeah, questions. Yeah, this it. one's a personal one for me. What is the most important fundamental part of being a human? Like, what is the most important part to you of having the human experience? This is a personal question for me. Yeah, what is the most defining human? For yourself. For me? Yeah. So, I think as humans, we have the capacity to either bring destruction or bring shalom. And shalom is like the Jewish word for like rebuilding a peace and it's like to make something whole. And for me to be human is to participate in shalom, to to make something whole again, something that's broken and whole. Yeah, and we've talked about that several so, times. It's a good, it's a very good concept. So I think to be truly human is to participate in that, that Rebuild restoration. Yeah. yeah, to be restored. And then the final question: If you can give any advice to yourself as if you were ten years old, and also in retrospect to the community, what advice would you give to the community, and what advice would you give to yourself as a ten-year-old that you have now? Advice as a ten-year-old. Parting gifted words to the community and yourself: A way to reflect before we wrap up. Yeah, if I were to tell myself something, I would tell myself, don't chase for other people's approval. Find out what you genuinely love. Because I spent a lot of my early years trying to gain other people's approval by being the best at something that they would appreciate, rather than finding what I wanted to appreciate. It's very self-defeating. Yeah. No, I, I, I've done the exact same. I actually had a very long, or not very long, but a, a very depthful conversation about this with Blair last night, so. Yeah, yeah. and I, I saw myself doing that a lot, even just like trying to earn my, my dad's respect, my father's respect, and by like trying to get good at the things that he would see and, you know, to get his validation rather than to validate myself. Yeah. So that would be, that'd be key. And that would probably be similar to how I'd, I'd speak to the Kanama community. I'd say like, hey, you as a Kanama player, don't focus on trying to do the tricks that you think will get appreciated by everybody else. Do the tricks and play the way that you want to play Kandama the best way that you want to play it. Like focus on, on finding your style, your creativity, find in, in the words of Parker Johnson, find your color and live that color. Pantone purple. Pantone purple, whatever it is. <laughs> find your color, do it. Yeah. Don't, don't live chasing. Well, if that's what we're going to end off on, I just want to say again, I'll say it a million times. Thank you for this opportunity to be on here. I, I both love and appreciate you as my friend. And this has been a really great opportunity, despite all of our technical glitches and issues and everything. But uh, I really look forward to seeing this afterwards and getting to listen to it and to look back on it. And congratulations on all of the hard work that you've put into making a whole year of review. And uh, I wish you all of the best of luck with the next upcoming years of review to come. And uh, I just I stay caffeinated, my dude. Stay caffeinated. We have a clank or boom? We can clank and we can fist bump. <laughs> that was just broke. Can I laugh? <laughs> I was trying to like, do it nice and soft and you just like, bang! <laughs> and that's a wrap. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's episode of The Review with my good friend, Kareem. Your host. <laughs> it's a privilege. <laughs> Our new host, he's taking over the review. Psych! No, we view now. <laughs> we are back at it next week with another episode of the review. I hope to see you there. Peace out. Peace. And stay caffeinated.